There we go. Is it on? Yeah. There we go. Yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the December 15th, 2022 Montclair Historic Preservation Commission meeting. Notice that it's been posted in this building and has also been advertised in the Montclair Times and the Star Ledger. We are being live streamed on Montclair Channel 34 TV and also on um, YouTube. So uh, let us uh, go to the roll call, Mr. Sevilla. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Ms. Bennett? Present. Mr. Heinman? Here. Mr. Rooney? Here. Mr. Reimnitz? Here. Mr. Graham? Here. Mr. Sweeney? Here. Mr. Connolly? Here. And, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Burr is not here at the it's moment. It's not here. Okay. Thank you, Tommy. Um, and then as far as, do you want me to make the announcements on what's being moved to the next meeting application-wise? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Um, so application, it's a Board of Adjustment referral application 2825 for 319 Claremont Avenue is being um, moved to the January 12th meeting um, pending the adoption of the calendar later this evening. Um, and then the, we have the Label Street Manufacturing District local landmark and nomination listed on this agenda, but that um, requires notice, which has not been done yet, and so that will be on the January 12th meeting as well. Thank you, Tommy. Um, then we have the minutes of November 17th, 2022. Are there any additions or uh, changes? Um, I had some comments on uh, the Orange Road, Mount Clair Historical Society. Uh, what page? Page three. Mm -hmm. um, no particular line items here, just that I thought we had discussed them that they would look at options that do not include damaging the interior of the existing house. That was one of the suggestions from Tom, and I thought indeed that it was a small little bump out that they would have to do, say, mm -hmm. in order to save the inter you know, interior integrity of the house. And I don't see that anywhere. I here. think that's on, if you go to page four, the mm -hmm. first bullet, um, the last sentence, every effort should be made to minimize damage to material and features when making modifications for accessibility and the primary changes, so changes do not compromise the historic character of the house. Would you say the historic interior? Um, that solve their issues outside the house, not necessarily inside the house, is what I would say. And this is sort of vague, you know, right. they'll, they'll look at it. Can we be more specific yeah. in, in there and uh, highlight Tom's comment on that? You understand where I'm trying to go. <laughs> you were concerned about the destruction of that uh, interior yeah, space? Yeah, that first yeah. room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, the solution. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I don't know what took over that space, but there's plenty of room on the site to accomplish what they need to do right. by not taking that space. So. Okay. You know, that's, that was. So okay, so I think the, the first bullet I have there is what was in Tom's report, and so I can just add some verbiage there to specify that the interior layout shouldn't be changed. Sure. There you go. Okay. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll go along with that. All okay. right. So anybody else have any comments? It was just on uh, page three, line 12. Um, the it states she stated that field trips that utilize buses do not pull into the site but um i think we should say something dropped children off or let children off on the street i think we just have to add something between but and children <laughs> i yeah. see but children yeah. off right on the street. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right drop children <laughs> off yeah. on the street okay um any others Okay, hearing no others, can it, may I have a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Abstain. And then we have two resolutions that were on the amended, um, on the amended agenda that Tommy posted. And those are resolutions uh, for the historic uh, preservation consultant, 
which it was w we'd like uh, Mr. Conley, uh, Conley and Hickey to continue for next year. So may um, I have a motion to approve that? Motion. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And uh, then we also have a motion for uh, the uh, Boswell Engineering, who will be our engineering expert for uh, any issues we have in the upcoming year. Um, I had a question about that. Um, under his services, is, are all those services provided by his firm? All the different... Um, here? Yeah. Or whether it's Yeah, all those technicians, senior designer, survey so, analysts, field technician. So all, do, are those, <clears throat> those are all of the when he when he's laid out his, his his pricing for the hourly cost of the services, we just list all of the line items that he has in there in the resolution and in, in the event that any of them need to be used for something. We didn't just kind of pick and choose from the list, we just list all of them. You list all of what we were looking for, or all what, what what was he, in included in the proposal? What he included in his proposal. Correct. So he provides all those services, or can provide all those services. Mm -hmm. Right. We won't necessarily be using every okay. single professional, okay. but okay. okay. Thanks. Um, so, any other questions? May I have a motion to approve this uh, contract for next year? Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then, I don't know, are we supposed to do anything with this, a certification of funds? No, that's just provided with the resolution to show that we have the, the okay, funding for it. Okay, that we have the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Woo. Yeah. laughs> um, all right, so before we get into the, the uh, 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 main event, is uh, we have public comment. Would anyone like to come up and uh, address the HPC? Good evening. Just state your name Hello. and address. Is this on? Is push press a button. Which button? It's, uh, on it's the mic, push. On the mic. Hello. Yeah, okay. We got, yeah, we got it. Ilmar Vanderer, 127 Edgemont Road. Good evening. So as a longtime supporter of historic preservation in Montclair and as the recipient of your very own 2020 Preservationist of the Year Award, I'd just like to go on the record tonight about the recent movement to preserve the James Howe House at 369 Claremont Avenue. Whether they are preserved for their Im historical importance, architectural significance, or both, these types of historic houses have long been part of America's cultural landscape. They're tangible objects from the past and they offer emotionally powerful settings and give history a sense of immediacy and urgency. This allows people to step back in time and feel in touch with something truly authentic in a rich and diverse educational environment. The Howe House offers a rare opportunity to simultaneously preserve an iconic landmark building and commemorate a pivotal chapter in local history. I'm hopeful that the HPC will offer its assistance, both symbolically and substantively, to support this incredibly important and inspiring effort. Next, I'd like to ask about 105 Upper Mountain Avenue, an Italianate villa that was mm -hmm. originally built by famed architect A.F. Norris for the prolific sculptor William Cooper, who was one of the first trustees of the Montclair Art Museum. It's so unexpected and unsettling to see the recent remodeling of its distinctive and unique facade which dramatically alters its historic and iconic appearance. Since this house is one of the most architecturally significant of the original Montclair art colony artists community that once existed here, can it possibly be designated by the HPC as a local landmark? Happy holidays. Thank you very much for your time and consideration and for all of the wonderful work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll just comment on 105. Sure. I've been watching that because we're doing a project next door to that. Mm. I think all the, uh, I don't know what's been filed there to do plans, but it looks like they're just re-stuccoing. They've stripped off the old deteriorated stucco. I don't know if there's any intent 
to change the character of the house per se. Um, don't know, but maybe we should, you know, take a look and see what's filed. Well, I think when we have discussion at the end of the meeting, that maybe we can think about um, possibly promoting that as a local landmark. Uh, it's not locally designated; it's on the state register. What is the status of the how? Do we have any information on I, the how house? Uh, no, I met with. I don't know. They 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 put an application into the SHPO uh, for. Um, state registry and they're doing research now i directed mm -hmm. them to the montclair uh history center because mm -hmm. they have the they have the uh crane archives so they need to have a more robust uh application in order for the state to consider it mm -hmm. and it is locally landmarked so right. if they were to change any exterior aspect of it it would have to come to the hbc so it is a a landmark it's designated it's as a local right law. it's local right. ah. okay they're just That's seeking something yeah state a state yeah. Uh, rec recognition um having no old business oh sorry <laughs> Um, Lisanne Renner, 42 Godfrey Road, Montclair. Um, I had a comment about the um, Lackawanna project that maybe could be um, addressed at the presentation. Um, it regards the uh, stanchions in the Station Plaza area, and I was unclear how many of those stanchions that you see in the conceptual plan are in their original locations and how many of them have been move to be put on that plaza because um, some of them it looks like they weren't there originally <clears throat> but I'm not sure about that and also I noticed that you know one row of them does still have the butterfly roof and the others don't and I was wondering why that was if that's just because um, physically they can't be replicated or moved or if there's another reason it would seems to me it would be a lot nicer to be able to retain those for shade and other reasons so Maybe that can be addressed in the presentation. Um, that actually has been addressed. So, but oh. we can at at, at the one of the public meetings. So, oh, okay. But I, I think with uh, we can uh, the consultants can talk about that, and Great. then you can understand where they're coming from. Okay. okay? Thank you. Thank you, Lizanne. Anybody else? No. Okay. So the main event. <laughs> Um, we have the consultants for the uh, redevelopment of Lackawanna Plaza who are going to give us a uh, run through of the plan, the proposed plan. And Ms. Janice Talley is here as our planning director to, I guess, introduce the plan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to just cut to the chase because you really don't want to hear from me. But we have Keenan Hughes here, who's the planning consultant who. Uh, put together and wrote the uh, redevelopment plan for Lackawanna Plaza and we have Ira Smith the architect who worked with Keenan and, and Ira developed the design standards um, all of us worked very closely um, with the the developer the owner who has a concept for this property to try and take his concept which is not a site plan we're working from a concept for development and frame a plan um, with the appropriate regulations and standards to allow development of this property in a manner that gives us what we want to achieve and we've been talking about this for years the grocery store we really want uh, housing particularly affordable housing is a what we want um, development to create a, 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 um, a very attractive um, area very vital pedestrian oriented we wanted open space but critical to all these pieces is um, preservation and maintenance of or advancement of the of the historic nature of this property preservation of the important resource historic resources um, in a manner that 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 works with the development so as you listen to the presentation tonight I, I really ask for your input uh, for the language in the redevelopment plan to identify those historic aspects and resources that are the most critical um, to, to being preserved in place to those that are important and may be moved um, to, to allow development of this of this uh, concept all of those items in terms of preservation and potential demolition should be incorporated into the redevelopment plan because we want this to, to embrace all of those factors 
So we really look for your input into that. So what I'd like to do is first have uh, Keenan give the overview, and then Ira will uh, go over the the designs. Okay. Are are you witnesses? Do they? Do you have to be sworn in as witnesses? It's no. No, it's a presentation. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Uh, good evening. My name is Keenan Hughes. So I was the planning consultant who worked on the redevelopment plan along with Director Talley's office and and Ira Smith's office. So. I'm going to start by just providing um, an overview of the plan, focus a little bit on the historic preservation aspects, and then Ira has some conceptual imagery and some further thoughts on the historic preservation issues um, involved in the plan itself. So um, here's the site. It's roughly 8.2 acres. Um, I assume all the commissioners are pretty familiar with this site um, at this point. Most of the historic elements are located on the, the west side. We do refer in the plan to the, the portion of the property to the west of Grove Street as the west parcel, and then to the east of Grove, Grove Street as the east parcel within the plan. Um, the existing topography, we focused on this uh, earlier this week with the planning board. Um, it's somewhat of a bowl-shaped property so that there's a change in grade from many vantage points around the property um, into the center of the property of roughly 8 to 10, in some cases 12 feet, um, which we think provides an opportunity to accommodate additional building height on this property um, in a manner that, that has a mitigation in terms of the visual impacts to the surrounding area. Um, the current zoning of the property is C1, so it's located within the downtown mixed-use zoning. Um, I'm going to jump forward a little bit. There's a number of objectives set forth in the redevelopment plan, many of which do relate to historic preservation. Um, but I think for purposes of this evening, we'll just focus in on the concept plan itself and then get into the preservation issues. So this is figure five in the plan, which is the regulating plan. It basically depicts the anticipated configuration of the buildings on this site. So on the west parcel, and just to orient you, Bloomfield Avenue is to the bottom of the page, Glen Ridge Avenue is to the top. So on the west parcel, west of Grove Street, it's anticipated that there will be three new buildings constructed. Those are labeled buildings A, B, and C. You can see just to the, the southwest corner of building A is the existing historic station waiting room, which would be adaptively reused and integrated into this project. Um, and then on the west parcel, two signature open spaces, the main plaza and station plaza. And in the plan, there's some description in terms of what's anticipated for both of those spaces, um, both of which have both public gathering, um, some potential for events programming, and uh, in particular with station plaza, it's envisioned that there will be the integration of some of the existing historic elements on the site as part of that, that plaza. Uh, this plan also um, illustrates uh, the requirements with respect to activating the ground floors around the buildings and also shows uh, where pedestrian entries as well as the, the circulation, uh, both pedestrian and vehicular, um, is anticipated. And then on the east side, similarly, the, the linear arts plaza um, along with buildings E and D, which is really one building, uh, because they are connected by a lobby um, in the middle. Um, and likewise, on the east parcel, we have an active ground floor. For the most part, there's portions that will be required to be an, an arcade space um, along Grove Street on the west side of the building, and then also the Linear Arts Plaza, which will have um, a component of the building which will function as, a, as an art gallery space. Um, in terms of anticipated uses on the west side, so building A is anticipated an office and grocery store, building B, residential and retail, building C, retail office, and then the historic station waiting room um, is envisioned to be an event exhibition space and also serve as the lobby for the office component within building A. And then both buildings on the east side are mixed-use residential over retail buildings. Uh, there is a 30% affordable housing set aside consisting of 20% for low and moderate income households and 10% for workforce housing. 
Um, we have requirements with respect to uh, non-residential gross floor area in each of the buildings. And then in figure six in the plan illustrates the required setbacks at grade and then upper story step backs for each of the five buildings as well as the overall maximum height limitations for each building. So those are depicted on this image. Uh, the building heights vary from five to six stories and the step backs are really tailored to each specific frontage within the project to really mitigate the impacts of building height on the surrounding areas um, and in particular uh, from the pedestrian vantage point um, at grade. Um, so with respect to the historic preservation aspects of the project, uh, do you all have a copy of the plan, by the way? Okay. Mm -hmm. So the historic preservation section is really on pages 35 and 36. It's section 3F of the redevelopment plan. And this, uh, the language here basically speaks to the preservation of the various existing historic elements on the site. So there's the waiting room building remains of the terminal shed, the train station canopies and steel structures, uh, the existing stanchions, the horse watering trough, the reinforced concrete stairs, balustrade and railing, and um, even the lighting columns. All are to be integrated within the project. And I think Ira in his presentation will share some conceptual images in terms of what's anticipated um, as far as the reuse of those elements. Um, there are some additional requirements set forth in this section in terms of uh, maintaining historic integrity as part of the reuse of each of these, um, and then also protecting the historic assets, um, not just as part of the, the future project, but even during demolition and construction that would facilitate the overall redevelopment. Um, so I would say before handing it off to, to Ira, um, you know, as Janice said, we're really looking for your input, um, even as it relates to, to very specific language within this section and elsewhere within the plan um, that we can then recommend back to council in terms of potential changes to the plan and consult with the property owner, prospective redeveloper um, to the extent needed. And I would also just add that um, when this application comes to the planning board in the form of a site plan application, it will be referred to the Historic Preservation Commission for an advisory review, and that's on page 96 uh, where that's stated. Um, so with that said, I'll hand it over to Ira. Thank you, Keenan. Uh, Good evening, Chair, members of the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, I'm going to go off script a little myself to get to the point and use Keenan's last slide to give you a more in-depth preview because I'll show you some three-dimensional views, but an in-depth preview of how these seven historic features are being uh, contemplated as within the plan itself and within the con conceptual uh, design we've been working with. Ira, before you begin, could you introduce yourself and your relationship to the uh, plan? Sure. So I'm a principal at Smith Marin Architecture and Interiors, started the office 25 years ago, and uh, we're based in Montclair. And we have previously been hired by the township to provide redevelopment design consultation. We worked on the Seymour Street project in particular and uh, reinvented the design standards that were used for that project. Um, almost concurrently, we were working on the Lackawanna redevelopment plan when the prior owner um, decided rather than going with the redevelopment plan, they would do uh, a project as of right. So that work was suspended. Um, and yet we were uh, in the process of uh, building on the lessons from Seymour Street when we were preparing Lackawanna's plan. So the township rehired us earlier this year to finish that work bring over a lot, of, a lot of other lessons we've picked up since then because uh, we were hired also to work on the project next to the Unitarian Church, which was the final piece of the Haynes Redevelopment Plan. 
Um, so we are, we, we, Keenan and I, work for the township, hired by the council and uh, mostly advised by the um, Economic Development Committee, which is a subset of the council. And you have a prior relationship with the HPC, right? Yes. Uh, I was thinking about that on my drive here. Um, I think it was just about 20 years ago exactly. I was uh, drafted, like perhaps any one of you, to join the commission. And um, I served on the commission for 10 years. And for most of that time, I was either vice chair or chair. And uh, it, was, it was an important part of my professional growth and an opportunity to give back to the community. So. I know several of you through that experience, and it's, it's good to be back with you and uh, have a chance to benefit from your own expertise and experience with the town center. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate that. And so uh, how many of you have seen, oops. Something to, okay. Testing, okay. How many of you have seen one of the prior presentations I've given that shows the three-dimensional renders. I think Mr. Graham, Chair Bennett, no one else? Mr. Sweeney, you were at one of them? I've seen a little bit. You've seen a little bit, okay. Maybe not the whole show, okay. Um, we'll get there, but uh, as Director Talley and Keenan said, the emphasis, we really wanna make sure it's on the historic elements. I'm gonna quickly go through the seven because I think it will put you in the right mindset when you see the visuals to kind of hunt and confirm and see how these elements are being treated in the conceptual plan which is um, embodied in the redevelopment plan itself. The waiting room, what some people call the station house, the waiting room itself is remaining in place. The intention really is to preserve the exterior and the interior uh, the language for the interior isn't in the plan yet, but we've gotten feedback that it's important. I mean, I agree with that. Uh, so there's some strengthening of language there. Conceptual uh, uses for it include having it serve as the lobby for building A, but it's a large space and it would make kind of an ideal place for an installation perhaps that tells the public about the history of the site. So that's potential programming for that, that building. The remains of the terminal shed. The terminal shed, and, and all of these pieces are uh, illustrated in the redevelopment plan as well, but the terminal shed is what we've been calling the large structure at the western end of where the supermarket used to be. It currently has bays of uh, metal and glass within each of the openings of a steel arcade there. What's been discussed, it's not visually depicted, but what, what's been discussed is removing um, the glass and metal bays which date from the 1980s when the space was enclosed and not altering the structure at all. The terminal, the idea for the terminal shed is that it will remain intact and in place. The steel structures or the stanchions, these would be the steel columns uh, that Ms. Renner uh, was referring to and these would have been supporting the butterfly concrete canopies overhead on each of those train platforms. I do have the numbers and I'll, I'll give you the numbers when I'm done with the rest of the presentation. There, I believe there are 55 plus or minus one or two, but I believe there are 55 original steel stanchions based on the conceptual drawings we have. 60% uh, of those are remaining in place and I'll explain where the, where the remaining 40% are likely to, to land or how they're being uh, adaptively reused. Uh, the horse watering trough, uh, again, cited in the redevelopment plan. The intention there is to relocate it to become more of a feature element of one of the plazas or signature spaces that Keenan mentioned and to make it active again as a fountain. Reinforced concrete stairs. So some of you may know that at the northernmost and southernmost platforms that served the train station, there were stairs. Well, actually, I'm not sure if they were on the outermost bays. Um, I haven't seen the historic photo in a while, but there were two sets of stairs that would allow you to walk on the platforms eastward toward Grove and then up stairs, up a set of stairs to Grove Street. These were obviously meant for pedestrians. One of those stairs remains in place, although it's been altered when the, uh, 
the slope of Grove Street was altered, which I think was done at the time of the supermarket construction. The second stair to the north is either gone or it's been consumed or buried within the supermarket. Um, I haven't been able to visit and do any probes for that second stair. But the southernmost stair, you can see it today in the outside. It's very close to the horse watering trough. Uh, the intent is for that to remain in place and be rehabil rehabilitated so it becomes um, uh, it's restored as a pedestrian route from Grove Street down toward the uh, plaza. And, and there are associated balustrades, decorative balustrades. You'll see those in the 3Ds uh, with that stair. Last item, the lighting columns. Um, they come in pairs. I think there are actually eight, in fact. There's two uh, very stylized, tall concrete piers on Grove Street. The intention is for them to remain in place uh, and be uh, relit. Uh, they've lost at least one of them. Maybe both now have lost the lanterns that were on top. And then there are three pairs of brick masonry columns that sort of framed entry points into the uh, plaza that served uh, people coming and going from the trains themselves. All of those are intended to remain in place and be rehabilitated. So keep that in mind, and I'll try to point those out as we go through the rest of these images. And if you'll give me a second, I just need to bring up the correct file. Adobe, Adobe. Is it under file or under? Yeah. Oh. That one? Oh, that's, that's great. I usually go into them old school. I go into the tabs. Thank you. Right. So um, this presentation is intended to help orient you to the redevelopment uh, plans, design standards, in which you'll find embodied a lot of the principles associated with historic preservation. Uh, so there's an emphasis on that. And then that's in this presentation, alternating with imagery from, uh, conceptual imagery from the project. As Keenan pointed out, it's a, it's a large site, 8.2 acres. Uh, it's worth mentioning because it's discussed in the design standards that the town center um, it's really seen three campaigns of construction from 1890s through the 1930s uh, in, terms of, in terms of the historic elements we still have. And that sort of begins with the Richardsonian Romanesque uh, elements. There are, there are important buildings that predate that, but that was a major period of building campaign in the 1880s and 90s. Uh, then we have the neoclassical period, 1910 to 1920, 25. And then in the 1930s, 40s, there's another spurt of investment. Uh, so you see some buildings influenced by art moderne or being modified in that way. The point is that we have what is described as a living museum in the town center. It's, it, was like a, it was a revelation to me while I was sitting on the commission because doesn't every town want its own sense of like, well, he, here's where we have the great uh, federal revival style. That's what we're about or, you know, any town that tries to champion or brand itself architecturally, they're usually able to point to a specific uh, period of significance, to use a historic preservation term. Montclair's different. It's really the eclecticism that gives the main street and the town center its charge. Less so in Upper Montclair, but in the town center, the richness comes from these great examples of buildings from very different periods of time or different architectural styles or rising and falling. This site embodies that uh, just as much as any other in the town center, maybe more than some. Um, I was describing to the planning board, and I don't think I need to do it for you as architecturally minded folk, but to the east, to the north, to the west, and to the south, you have very different typologies. Whether we're talking about something that's highly suburban like a gas station or the TD Bank, really intended for car-centric culture, uh, the 
uh, I described it as exurban development of the Montclair Muse, putting a parking lot front and center on a main street. We do have the multifamily building at northeast corner of Grove and Glen Ridge, and next to it we suddenly have single family homes with detached garages. And then we could keep moving westward, the funeral home again with parking in front of it, the post office, one story, 1960s, wonderful little community post office right on the sidewalk, and the Taekwondo next to that, which has a weird little space handy, where you can park in front of it. So there's an, there's an eclecticism that circles this site. And then within it, of course, uh, unlike other projects you've probably seen that this town typically sees, we have historic elements on our site, within the site itself, that have to be respected and, and dealt with. So the design standards differ in that regard from the ones I mentioned, the Seymour Street guidelines and the uh, Haynes redevelopment in that they take into account historic preservation in a different way. And I'll talk more about that. Um, and everything I'm gonna show you and explain to you is, as Keenan and Janice mentioned, it's been coordinated with, or it should be coordinated with all the other language in the plan. The design standards make up about 50% of this plan. And uh, we've done our best to coordinate. For those of you who are serious readers and are into that level of proofreading, any kind of inconsistency, we wanna hear about it. And we would certainly like to resolve it. And then last, the site plan submission requirements are extensive. Uh, this project's double the size of Seymour Street, so you would expect them to be significant. In fact, we have expanded the site plan submission requirements, and I'll touch on how that affects historic preservation as well. So the design standards, as they were for Seymour Street, are in three parts. Rules, tools, and direction. The rules section uh, talks about general principles for town center planning. A lot of this came from this body. Uh, it was a very helpful process when we built the Seymour Street redevelopment plan and a lot of the contributions came, believe it or not, not so much on building design but on space and placemaking. Uh, so you may recognize certain principles or ideas about how buildings and spaces that they shape can work together to enrich the environment and make for an interesting walkable mixed-use community. So you get rules that are overarching. Then you get tools. The tools section deals with what I call the DNA of the buildings that exist within the town center. And it uh, is really an instruction manual for mostly architects, but also developers who might question their architects, like, well, how are you deciding what a good building should be or a proper building should be? So we use the examples of uh, many of the key landmark buildings in the town center and uh, a couple of contributing as well. And then direction, the third section. Direction focuses on the Lackawanna site and has specific uh, recommendations, requests um, for how these rules and tools would be applied to the Lackawanna site. So these are snapshots, if you will, from the redevelopment plan itself. I'll be showing you images now and Going back a little bit to some of the redevelopment plan itself, um, think of these as supplemental to the redevelopment plan. They do not appear in the redevelopment plan, but it's an example of the kind of project that the redevelopment plan is attempting to describe and that the redeveloper uh, themselves have, has talked about wanting to achieve. So these are, um, even though I, I mean, I'm here to represent the township, I, I do believe that Having had several meetings with the redeveloper, their two different architectural firms and their landscape architectural firm, that they have set the bar very high for themselves in terms of the architectural and landscape architectural development. So what we're seeing here, I think, will be very consistent with what's ultimately in the site plan. As you've heard, five buildings. And as depicted here, you can see the buildings all uh, step, have step backs in order to minimize their visual impact at street level. The intention was certainly to reduce their overall bulk, but also to give the buildings a chance to kind of uh, taper back down to the surrounding neighborhood. At the same time, you can see the site's not filled solid with buildings. There are large spaces uh, carved away where the buildings are forming outdoor rooms. Because, uh, you know what, I'm going to switch to the, the mic at this point.
You hear me okay? Testing, testing, okay. So I'm referring, of course, uh, when I talk about the stepping back, that's the face of the building stepping back. Keenan uh, highlighted the table for you. These are significant step backs, especially compared to other recent projects that have incorporated them. And then the signature spaces, call that the main plaza, station plaza, and a linear park, which is partly obscured because of the nature of this building. Calling out the historic elements, we've got the waiting room here. And uh, I know there's some other images coming, but uh, just quickly, the stanchions in front of the east face of the waiting room and across the face of the supermarket, all of which we can see today, they'll remain in place. This whole group is currently uh, hidden by the supermarket. But these are located, the ones in the space called Station Plaza are located uh, where the original stanchions would have been. These are the two piers, the tall masonry piers on Grove. And I know just because I know there's one, two, three more of those brick uh, and cast stone masonry piers on grade on the west side. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you. Next. Don't want to overdwell on this, but the, uh, the stepping back, the carving away of these buildings was the product of a sky exposure plane analysis looking at when you take sections across the street, and you know, not just of the site itself, but what's happening across the street and the size of buildings across the street. Uh, what are you actually going to see as a pedestrian or if you're in a vehicle? And the design team and the redeveloper has used an angle very similar to what was used to generate the step back for the Seymour Street project on Bloomfield Avenue and within the Seymour Street Plaza. Next slide. Next slide, just very similar, and uh, it shows different conditions along the edge. There are many of these studies that led to the different kinds of step backs you're seeing, and these are just a couple of images from that. Next slide. The site is very uh, porous in terms of the amount of uh, space and the ways you can walk through it uh, while vehicles are kept more at the edges for interacting with parking or loading that's associated with the project. So really through the heart of the project, you have a lot of interconnectivity. The intention is to make it inviting for people in the neighborhood uh, to easily sort of get onto the site and see wonderful things, which you'll see in the ground level views and find their way to, let's say, a, a building destination or even one of these park-like spaces. Next slide. I hope I'm not blocking anyone, okay. Um, the redevelopment plan includes 10 photographs of the site from ground level and it's going to be up to the redeveloper at the time of site plan submission to populate those very images with digital models that accurately portray what the project is doing within the site. The architecture you see here is placekeeper. Um, the, we and the redeveloper felt it was probably better rather than showing you blank boxes, uh, if we were gonna share these images at all, give, to give people a sense of how the form breaks down uh, architecturally, how the character overall might work. This is certainly one of the most important views. Um, people are, I think, justifiably wondering how will the waiting room be treated? In other iterations of this project, we've seen development lining Bloomfield Avenue or pushed back. Uh, in this scheme, there's a freestanding building on the corner which is pushed back from Bloomfield Avenue, uh, which is used in terms of shaping one of these outdoor spaces to create uh, uh, a more defined setting for the waiting room. Um, one of the things I like to point out is that this building's footprint is not much larger than the waiting room's footprint. It, it's larger here because it's closer to us. Uh, but if we go to the next slide, we have uh, several other images, although these two don't really depict it super well, but we have several other images taken around the site 
uh, which will allow you to kind of gauge better, even better than perhaps what you can get with those physical models, a sense of how certain buildings, of course, when they're closer to you, appear bigger. And when they're further away, they do kind of uh, perceptually become smaller or less significant. Uh, and you get to understand better how, they, how the buildings together add up to make a whole that's more uh, interesting than what you'll get from any single image. So this is from the submission requirements, just highlighting that these, these 10 photos uh, are going to be an important part of the submission for evaluation of the project. Next. Uh, and one thing you'll notice for the close readers, I'll, I'll tip you off because we have to address it. Um, we we underdocumented Lackawanna Plaza, so the terminal shed uh, can be depicted properly. We need to add a couple more photographs, so I expect that 10 photo montage to grow to at least 12, maybe more. We'll now look at some of the imagery uh, that shows you what's possible within the redevelopment plan, focusing on the the outdoor rooms, I like to call them. This is the main plaza space facing Bloomfield Avenue. Uh, we can see the waiting room is pretty much left undisturbed. Uh, it does currently connect back to a structure that's happening to the north, but the idea is to liberate the building a bit uh, so that it can be freestanding as it once was and yet still have uh, protected uh, undercover connection to the functional part of building A. As I mentioned, the steel stanchions here and along here, the intention is to leave them undisturbed. I'll talk more about the possible coverage uh, or roof condition for those with other slides. And let's go to the next slide. Uh, there are myriad ways to use this plaza and these are some depictions of how the plaza is really meant to be a shared space over the course of the year so that hopefully continually interesting things are happening there and the only way to do that is to make it possible. So I've been using the word piazza to describe the real intent of this space. Next slide. Uh, you might have noticed in the previous slide as here, the intent is yes, to have a uh, cartway to make it possible to do short term pickup and drop offs and loading but also uh, uh, incorporate bollards into the design so that the Cartway can be closed off, and this whole space from building face to building face, building to sidewalk, can be reserved and used by the public. Next slide. And uh, although some of you weren't here at the time, images like this were part of our discussion for Seymour Street because we were closing a street and making a, a new kind of space for the town center. So these are just some precedents for the kind of space that can be created, balancing, you know, uh, with your feedback, planning board's feedback, hardscape versus softscape. This happens to be in Wales. Um, I think Mr. Graham made a point, which is a good point, uh, that these images aren't necessarily perfectly analogous to uh, Lackawanna because the heights of the buildings do tend to be lower here, although at the castle, I, I, I suspect this is a very tall turret, but you know, that's just a turret, not a building. Uh, next slide. Uh, here we are in Knoxville, um, more so to show how uh, you can redefine a place so that there is a space for cars, usually at the edges, and places for people as well, and they can coexist and actually help each other out. So you can have the market when you want to have the market, uh, or you don't allow cars in, and you fill the space with seating, and it becomes a festival space, and so on. Next slide. And uh, this is in Pittsburgh, which, which does have taller buildings, a mix of taller buildings and shorter buildings. For scale purposes, the main plaza we're talking about is approximately two-thirds the size of this space. Next slide. Uh, now we're going to sort of drop down into the space so you can you get a glimpse here of the steel stanchions and their uh, roof. And next. Now we've walked to the northeast corner of that main plaza. It's meant to uh, lead you and connect very easily into what we're calling Station Plaza. Some of you have um, perhaps heard about the rail car that the redeveloper has purchased. It's in the process of being restored and the intent is to 
have it there on site to kind of memorialize and give people a sense of the, the scale and operation of this place back in the day. As I mentioned before, and you can see them populating here, uh, these steel stanchions are located in the place that they would have been originally. Now it may sound like I'm, I'm hedging, I'm hedging, why am I hedging? Um, the steel stanchions that are there today, some of them have already been removed and some have already been altered. Uh, the removals um, do constitute historically like the loss of historic fabric. So when I said I think there are 55, that's how many there would have been when this station was in operation. It's possible there are less due to removals we can't see. It's also likely, I know for a fact, that several of these stanchions, especially uh, just behind the, the south facade, if you've, if you've been in there, the, the grade was raised. So a number of these steel stanchions are... Uh, I think it's, it's a joke in New Jersey. They have concrete feet. They've been buried 12 to 24 inches. Uh, so there's concrete removal to be done, which could mean that it might be necessary to uh, recreate some of the steel for these stanchions. So uh, when I get back to the podium, I'll read off some numbers I have, but I think it is important to reference the historic condition, believing there was 55 total. Uh, and just over 60% are intended to be, uh, to remain in place if they can, if they can't be, to be refurbished so they can uh, stand in place or if necessary to be composed possibly of, uh, uh, let's say s there might be some of these columns that really aren't in condition to stand on their own but they could be reconstituted and located back where they were originally. I'll get to the, um, I'm working my way to the roof coverage. Uh, next slide. Um, Keenan already mentioned this, but uh, it wasn't necessary in prior redevelopment plans to talk about the care of these historic elements before construction. So we've introduced um, a nice new paragraph regarding the protection of historic elements. That's in the plan now. Uh, and the basis for that is the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the protection of such elements before and during construction to ensure that there's no loss of that fabric due to flood, fire, vandalism, etc. Next. Now we are on Grove and in the bottom left you're looking at uh, part of the entry into the rebuilt stair that leads you back down to what I'll just call the plaza. We can see the waiting room in the distance, so we would see its canopy coming along this edge, a, a view and an experience uh, that hasn't been seen literally for decades. All of the platforms you know, extended eastward toward Grove Street, so you're looking at a field of columns essentially. And uh, this is that space we've been calling Station Plaza. In the next view, you'll see a little bit of where the watering trough is slated to move to. So next. We're now further north along Grove, elevated a little bit. Here's the balustrade. And right here, those are the characteristic caps that frame the horse watering trough. So that's centered on Station Plaza. The idea is to not just restore it uh, or to, to, to preserve it through rehabilitation and adaptively reuse it as a fountain so you get both the sight and sound um, in this defined outdoor room of Station Plaza. Now I'll talk about the roofs. So this, as I mentioned, these are supplemental drawings, illustration drawings. We've had conversations with the redeveloper about what's appropriate and not appropriate. Certainly what's key is that whatever treatment is applied that uh, the steel stanchions are not threatened by you know, just the course of the seasons with rain, snow, ice that might sit up here and lead to rust and so on and a heavy program of maintenance of scraping and painting. Um, the redeveloper and their team actually seemed kind of excited about not just doing arbors with flowers, which I thought was lovely actually until I really thought about it, um, but having perhaps something that's uh, something between, let's say, the openness of an arbor and the solid concrete roofs, perhaps a butterfly roof that's skylit. So you get the benefit of the light uh, as well as the protection of the historic elements. And then your mind kind of goes from there. Well, is it, is it really clear glass or is it fritted glass? Uh, so you can provide shade or it could even be a, a mixture of these things or solid concrete with solar on top. There's a lot of different 
ways in which this could go. Um, but uh, the dedication to the history of the place and the use of rail transportation, I think, is close to the heart of the redevelopment team. So I would expect this to continue to only see like increasingly thoughtful solutions for preserving and um, celebrating these elements. Now, there's one more image. We're uh, standing over the underpass. The current underpass uh, starts with a, an outdoor kind of rotunda on the east side, and then you're led into a tunnel into the supermarket on the west side. That whole tunnel piece on the west side is removed, so it's all open air, including under the underpass, and on the, as you'll see in the next slide, the rotunda is gone, and you have a much more inviting outdoor space or passage, which is the same width, would be the same width as Grove Street above, and the linear park. I didn't point it out in the prior image, but the intention, uh, because the supermarket is occupying the ground floor on the west side, uh, it's very hard to have a glazed wall on the west side of Station Plaza, so the idea is that that would be a, a place for, for, for an artwork, art piece. Uh, Maybe it's painted, maybe it's sculpted. Uh, it's a very big opportunity to do something that relates perhaps, reinforces uh, the history of, of rail transportation here. And then as you're coming through to the east, next slide, thank you, um, reserving a space in the base of the building's D and E for art, changing art. So this is uh, you know, a project that's not just about preserving historic space, but going another step with amenities that include art uh, that's both fixed in place and art that's changeable that theoretically could respond to the site itself. Um, but that's talked about in the redevelopment plan as well. So we're looking north, of course, and you can see uh, a lot of effort's been made and it's documented in the plan to make sure everyone can get to all of these places to enjoy the historic elements and access to all of the uses on site. So it's, it's employing universal design with a series of uh, ramps, steps, or whatever, so that uh, you know, everyone, as I said, regardless of ability, can take advantage of the various amenities. That's the last image. And I will read off to you, I'll quantify uh, the numbers on the steel stanchions, because I think that, that could be hap ha uh, helpful for us. And then I do want to, well, I'm, Getting this out, if you guys could go to page 35, there's specific language there about the seven elements, uh, which, I, which we want to run through with you. But uh, looking at the stanchions, so we believe there were originally a total of 55, which potentially are all still there, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, three of those are associated with the waiting room, which I've pointed out. And there are 13 that run across uh, presently the south facade of uh, the building that's on site. So that accounts for 16 of the 55. There are another 18 stanchions in Station Plaza. And now you're up to 34. And 34 is 62% of the original 55 stanchions. Of the remaining 21 stanchions, Nine are accounted for, they're shown in some of the redeveloper studies as populating part of the east side. Potentially the raised area, uh, it's off screen on this image, the raised area between buildings D and E. And that would leave 13 unaccounted for. There's been some discussion about using stanchions to help make the bus shelter. Uh, in the back of my mind, as I mentioned, I'm not even sure we have a total of 55 to play with, if you will. Uh, and then there's this issue of potentially needing to um, salvage pieces of stanchions that really can't be used whole in order to reconstitute full stanchions. So the 13 are, I'm um, describing them as unaccounted for, uh, but potentially being, you know, contributing to the rebuilding of the necessary ones that would be left in place in the final design. I hope that clarifies the steel stanchions uh, question. So obviously with seven historic elements, the stanchions being one of them, that leaves six, and uh, they are to varying degrees um, uh, 
worthy of extended discussion. I think the horse watering trough, for example, compared to the waiting room is very different animals. Uh, on the other hand, the terminal shed, uh, as I've mentioned, the intention there is just to strip away the non-historic or the parts that are not from the period of significance and um, uh, leave in place uh, the original terminal shed structure. So what page 35 does, it, it gives you the actual language where the plan talks about uh, managing these historic elements and doing so in a way that is in accordance with the rehabilitation guidelines for the Secretary of the Interior Standards. The specific language matters a lot. In accordance, should versus shall and so on. I don't know if the commission wants to use this evening to literally go through each element or maybe ask us questions about you know, what, maybe what we haven't told you yet about the fate or intent with these elements or if it's more a matter of uh, post-meeting conversation for you to come back to us with, with comments or recommendations. But the, the critical passage is, is uh, it starts on page 35 and continues to 36. Thank you, Ira. Thank you. Um, well, before we open it up for questions from uh, the commission, um, I would just like to point out that um, this is probably the most significant historic site that we have in Montclair. It's emblematic, really, of Montclair and why Montclair became the way it is today. I mean, it brought people in from all economic uh, stratus, from, and it provided jobs for all economic stratus, from porters to uh, uh, bringing goods in for um, building. Uh, it, it's really a, a significant uh, place in Montclair. And um, it really changed our, our uh, concept from an agricultural uh, center to a, uh, in, it, it, I don't want to say industrial, but it opened up the pathway to have people from all economic strata to come, the very wealthy that made the big houses on the, the hill, um, that really became involved in the, the you know, the everyday uh, life of the township and made decisions uh, on that. But um, so it's, it's extremely, extremely important. So my question to you is, having said that, um, this is on the local uh, landmark in, in the uh, Town Center Historic District. It's also a New Jersey register and also the uh, railroad, the, the operating, it's in the thematic, thematic nomination of operating passenger, passenger railroad stations and listed in the New Jersey Register in 84. Um, so I'm just wondering why you haven't put that into your opening statement, which occurs on page four, I think. You have, the, uh, you have one listing that is on the National Register. I think that's a fair comment. We could certainly, and we should, reference right. its local designation as well as the, the other thematic designation. We should do that. Okay. Um, and so I have a, I mean, this is the second go around for some of us on the, on the commission. So I have a letter here from um, the SHPO office with the, if you go on the, they, since the last time they have put up this, uh, JS Finder, the Lucy, have you, have you looked at that? No. no. Okay, so, so in reality, when you go on the um, website, this whole area from the west side and also on the east side is considered historic. So I can share this. I, in fact, I can give you this copy. And then it has all of the um, registers in here, which you could certainly, you don't have to go digging for it. So I, have, I just wanted to point that out uh, before we begin our discussions, because I think it's very important that uh, we look at it through that lens. And I know before um, Tommy sent everybody a history of the uh, site that was, I guess, from 2017. And then also the resolution that the HPC had uh, wrote to the planning board from that time where we listed all of the um, elements that Ira, you spoke about. And the one thing that's missing from what you spoke about is, is the view shed and the view shed from Bloomfield Avenue of the historic waiting room. 
So I think that's something that needs to be added. You said that there were seven, that we need to add that for number eight. Agreed. Kathleen, I wanted to ask something about the, I looked at, I was not at the earlier uh, 2017 or 18, whenever we first looked at the plan. Um, but I look at it as while we treat it as one redevelopment site, it appears that the west lots have the historical significance, at least in my opinion, and the east lots, um, if it has historical significance, all the history that I've seen has been empty or not having any uh, historical elements. So, you know, I wonder if we, uh, we could actually look at the, uh, the two sides as uh, in different, applying uh, different uh, approaches to it. Meaning, the, there are a lot of historical elements on the West Lots, and the plan seems to have preserved um, most, uh, most of those elements. That's, and, and that would be uh, the area which I think we would be most focused on. The east side, yes, it abuts against the area, and and uh, but there's nothing on the site to be preserved, at least not that I'm aware of. So uh, my question is, uh, do we treat it as one site or uh, separate it as essentially two, at least having subsections on the two different sides? Well, why would we separate it if they're presenting it as one site? I mean, I, I, and it's I all in the same district, right? Yeah, all, yeah. And, 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 the, and the state um, considers it to be historic. The state considers the East Lots as historic? Yes. With, with what elements of it? What, as a parking the, lot or what? No, no. No, no, I, I, what was on the, uh, the East Lots? <laughs> the, uh, well, the railroad, tr tracks. railroad tracks that came in. Okay. So it's a site. It's not. It's not necessarily the element. You know, the the physical element. It's a site. And just what I brought up about the site, the view shed, the the site to the uh, train. Okay. The wait, You know, the waiting room. Thank you. Okay. At least uh, now I understand that. Uh, okay. okay. I, I will have other questions, but that's. A well, the jury's point. Just one question on the rotunda. What's the uh, history on that? I'm uh, forgive my ignorance on that. Isn't that the eighties? I, I'm assuming it was the 80s, right? Is that? Uh, yeah, that yeah. that was built as part of the supermarket development in the okay. early 80s. Yep. Thought so. Thank you. So, um, so why don't we start uh, questions <laughs> with the commissioners? <laughs> <laughs> Who would like to start with questions? John. I have a basic. What's the process here? Seen a presentation. We saw the presentation. We're going to ask questions of the if there's any thing that we need clarification on, mm -hmm. then um, as I understand it, we will formulate some type of discussion points that we will uh, formulate into a resolution that will then be sent to the uh, planning board. Mm -hmm. And at the, our next meeting uh, during that time, Tom Conley, as our historic uh, preservation consultant, will write a report so that the next meeting we'll be able to discuss that more fully. And that all works within the time frame, correct, Tommy, that I? Correct, and I think. I understand from the planning board meeting that I attended. Yes, and I think it, Janice confirmed that February 6th is the planning commission's, planning board's deadline. February 4th. February 4th but is the, the deadline. the report has to be completed at their second January meeting. And what is the date of that, do you know? Off the top oh. of your head, I, I saw some okay. place where our recommendations could either go to the plan, planning board or directly to the town council if we're not ready to get it to the planning board. Not the option either. Either, right? There's okay. yeah, there's no statutory requirement. You can. It's up to you. I think it's probably beneficial. I'm, I mean, I may be biased as you know, liaison to the planning board, but I think it would probably be beneficial to the planning boards and instructive to the planning board's report uh, to have our input prior and even if that maybe would require a special meeting it might be worth it in this instance for a project so when this is, scale yeah i agree yeah. january 23rd oh so when's ours is the 12th ours is the 12th yeah okay does so that, that work it that works then for the yeah, timing yeah but knowing that um we'll have to you know time it with when the packets go out to the planning board because the reports you're not going to have the report 
ready by the next meeting, I assume. So it will have to be authored and sent and ready for distribution before the planning board's packets. How soon would we have to have something ready for the planning board? What would be like? The, what, what, I'm sorry. What would be the drop dead date to have something right. ready? The for week, the board? The, one week prior to the, so the the uh, Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday before the meeting. What so about day? one week. What um, date is that? The sixteenth, I think, or so. Eighteenth. Okay, so I'll I'll note that in the thanks Tom. in my notes. So perhaps we would have to have a meeting prior to the twelfth, especially. So if we're going to do that. Right. Or we could schedule one right after the twelfth, if whatever is easier for. If, well, I mean, what if you know to streamline things? What if we get our individual comments to Tommy, and he could just compile it in a list? We could review it beforehand, and then we could just deliberate during the meeting and it's already written and then yeah I could distribute that in the packets it's ready to go that night of the 12th it's great for idea. January mm -hmm. yeah so I guess if everybody I mean then we would need everyone's individual comments the week prior to the the meeting on the 12th yeah. well as long as you can send that out to everybody yeah I mean as long as I have it in advance because and I can January compile 12th it yeah. is also the reorganization yeah. meeting too. so bef before the new year <laughs> right get your comments to Tommy <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. So, um, questions. Why don't we start to the left? I want to start with a generalized question. I, I know you looked at all the historic elements of the uh, the west lot. I guess the east lot. I missed that there were tracks on there because they haven't been visible for some time. So uh, you have to look at the history of it. What? Uh, consideration of the history of the immediate area went into the preparation of the overall plan. I assume that was considered. And if it did, what consideration was given? The immediate area meaning the immediate surrounding areas of this site. Hmm. Would the neighborhood, would you? The neighborhood, exactly. Immediately surrounding neighborhood. So you specifically asked about consideration of the history of the neighborhood surrounding. Well, uh, history and the existing buildings as of this date. So even though the images I showed, I described the building's architecture and the facades as being placekeeper, um, I'm aware of preliminary work done by the redevelopment design team to uh, draw from uh, typology or materiality of the architecture that surrounds the site, but even further afield. And that's something I think, uh, I think that this commission, I'm open to it, but I think the commission should be open to it as well because of the scale of the site. Um, and the mandate by the Secretary of the Interior that new architecture is not intended to be confused with older architecture. New architecture should be of its time and yet find ways to be compatible with historic architecture. I think uh, we wouldn't want to create a site whose inspiration is any single building or two when we're really making five buildings and we have the influence of these dramatic structures on site, the waiting room, the steel stanchions uh, are kind of, uh, I mean, they come from the Beaux-Arts style and, and era, but the stanchions have a particular industrial character, which is special to the site and could itself be a source of inspiration. So I think um, at the site plan the submission, the time of site plan review, we'll all know a lot more about the design intent for the buildings, but I know that the surrounding buildings are being looked at uh, so that whatever architecture is here has a relationship in terms of its materiality, let's say, to or other buildings. So is it your, uh, your statement that it's, those will be addressed in the site plan, they're not really addressed in the, in the development, the redevelopment plan? That's right. That's right. Um, but, and yet the design standards do talk about this, talk about 
this issue of compatibility and the design standards include examples of buildings around the site and how they may or may not be helpful cues for how to organize the rhythm, uh, materiality, and so on of the buildings on this site. So it's, it, it all leads there, but you're correct. Those answers come at the site plan review. Okay, I have a, just another question on that. Then is the overall redevelopment plan for the entire properties uh, scale, other type, is it, is it uh, consistent with the overall historic character of the immediate surrounding area? What a great question. Um, I, I would say, I, I mean, I can give you an answer that, that's an absolute yes, but, but the site is so complex, that what's around the site is so complex and the site itself is so complex that this is something that deserves a really long conversation and it slips into um, architectural theory and philosophy pretty quickly. But I will say, which I, I was explaining when we were looking at this overview, the site is not just transitional in that we move from the main street of Bloomfield Avenue to developments to the, to the west, to the north and the east. Um, all of the space around the site and within the site is atypical for our main street. It's full of holes. We talk a lot about building a street wall to generate that traditional classic main street feel. Well, right off the bat, if we did that along Bloomfield Avenue, we'd be obscuring the waiting room, which deserves visibility, the view shed point that was made. Uh, there are other historic elements that are on site that are covered and the intention is to uncover them. So in a, in a way, I would just say that the openness of the site, its porosity, its unpredictability in this concept plan is very consistent with the sort of turn a corner and you see something different of the current site conditions and the neighborhood right around it. Okay, I would think uh, in the same way the introduction, you mentioned the historic, uh, we should mention the historic element, you should mention the historic element and the ice and, and the area. And if there's, uh, it's your opinion that the, the overall plan will be consistent in a historic character with the surrounding area, I think it would be helpful to say that. Okay, Thank you. So Ira, I appreciate your answer. But um, I would just like to ask you, within that framework, the scale, the height of the proposed project, how, how does that fit in with your uh, explanation of that it, 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 with the neighborhood? Yeah, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this. Um, uh, other than the redevelopment, team and perhaps Janice, I've had the most time to think about it. And I think the redevelopment plan, oh yeah, we have some models for you. I think the redevelopment plan is clear, like uh, just to start with the most basic uh, land use legal reading, um, the redevelopment plan is clear that uh, additional height or density is allowed um, when there are public amenities. And my own personal feeling, which is not meant to represent the township or the council or anybody else, is that to solve the complexity of the site, uh, drawing on that allowance, in other words, adding a story or two more than you might have expected in order to create these open spaces um, is, a, is an appropriate balance that you are creating public space which the town center has always needed. You can go back to the, it's mentioned in the redevelopment plan, the 1909 Nolan Report. Um, it, it's, uh, I was at the HPC's website this evening and happy to see a, a nice splash page. The quote is, I think it's from the Montclair Art Museum perhaps. Uh, Montclair is the most beautiful suburban town in, in the country. The Nolan Report says it could be. This is a year later and Nolan of course is the father, so to speak, of, of landscape architecture and town planning in this country. Um, he talks about the need for open space, uh, creating a town center and town green, and we haven't had that ever since Montclair split from Bloomfield. Um, you know, the town green in Bloomfield on Broad was the town green for 
this part of this area. Montclair split from Bloomfield. We never really had a town green. Eight acres is so much. I characterize it as a, as a new neighborhood. Um, not, not at all should be thought of as separate from the pre-existing surrounding neighborhood, but in the way I described to Mr. Sweeney, you know, tying back into it. So to me, the addition of the height is what allows for these other conditions, openness to the historic elements, permeability, access for everyone to enjoy that. And that's, um, that's the point of consistency with historic historic character and preservation for me. The height allows these other things. But uh, Mr. Smith, wouldn't you say that the heights do change the character because as we discussed, you and I had a discussion about this at the planning board meeting. Um, you did show a fine example in, in Pittsburgh of a plaza that is attractive, uh, that does provide um, open space for the public. But you know, I don't think anybody envisions Montclair becoming um, a, a metropolis like uh, Pittsburgh. And I think the uh, lower scale uh, homes, uh, the lower scale buildings in the Welsh example, in the Knoxville example, uh, more represent the history and character of uh, the uh, of Montclair as a whole. Um, so wouldn't you say that, you know, adding an additional bulk and height would certainly change the character and would not necessarily fit with the history of Montclair? It would change it, but what I need to remind myself, and I'd encourage the commission to remember, and it's discussed in the redevelopment plan, before the Wedgwood building existed, the building that is a block long on South Park Street, uh, you had several smaller buildings. The Wedgwood building changed South Park Street and turned it into a much more uh, grand space and gesture. The Montclair Art Museum set back from South Mountain, uh, same thing. And um, I think, I, again, I think about this a lot. This project, there's only one eight acre parcel like this in town. Um, if you're going to, if you're making a new neighborhood or a new place, it, it can become anything. It could become background buildings, two, three, four stories max, and you're just sort of placing something there that uh, the next generation might look at and wonder, I, how did this waiting room end up in the middle of these buildings that seem to blend in with the neighborhood? What's, what's important about this place? I actually believe that extra height, maybe not all the extra height, but that extra height at this location, uh, a geographic and cultural crossroads, as Chair Bennett pointed out, is appropriate to, to celebrate. There are other conversations earlier in this process just to like illustrate something out of the blue. The town has, is punctuated here and there with towers. Uh, someone speculated perhaps what's needed is a tower mm -hmm. and a lot of other lower stuff. Uh, that would certainly mark this site as an important place. Um, I guess I'm, I'm myself, and I, I think the plan gets there, uh, coming to terms with the idea that uh, it's, it's too big to allow ourselves to think um, uh, we can just sort of apply something that is neutral. I think whatever we do will be transformative, and because of the importance of the site, uh, I think strong gestures, bold gestures are appropriate. Now, are, are these gestures too bold or not bold enough in a certain way? I, I mean, that's why it's good to have an audience with you yeah. and the planning board. I think that's an, I think that's an, I, I really do respect the point that you made about, you know, not in this, change is not necessarily a, 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 a wrong or something to be fought against. I think though, and you have been thoughtful with this plan about how we activate the space there and how we get more open space. Um, but I do think we need to keep in mind uh, Planning Board Chairman John Wynn's words when he said that we're not necessarily creating a new neighborhood. I'm going to butcher his words. But we're not creating a new neighborhood here. A neighborhood exists here, and we want to enhance that neighborhood, and we want people to have, uh, people in the community have a place that enhances their life and their, their, um, uh, their community there. So, you know, and I think we're all wrestling with the question of does, uh, you know, the bulk and the height of these buildings uh, change that in a way that might be might negatively impact the community as a whole. So I respect what you said. That is uh, uh, an important point about not fearing change and maybe be having bold strokes. 
Uh, but I think we also have to be careful and move ahead carefully. Um, and one of the uh, areas that I think we should also look at, I, I know uh, Mr. Sweeney makes a good point, there aren't a lot of historic assets on the east side uh, of this property, but there is also an opportunity there to activate more public land, more public space there based off the design that we've seen. Um, there does seem to be a lot of land there used for residential and for building space, but maybe we could take into consideration that that might be an area where we can add more public benefit and public, public good. Mm -hmm. And could you clarify in terms of height? Um, it, I know it's six stories, but I understand that it's, it's going up higher than uh, six. Isn't, I heard something 89 feet? Feet or something? 89 and a half and 87 right. feet, which yeah, would be so essentially two additional stories. Right. It varies by building. Um, exactly. Some but of it's, right. it depends on the topography. It also depends on the programming of the building. So, for example, Building A, where it's anticipated that there will be a grocer tenant, which, you know, is a very important aspect of this plan, that requires pretty significant floor-to-ceiling height within the ground floor. So that is why um, a six-story building and that configuration gets to roughly 88 feet, you know, from, from grade to, to top of roof. But Mr. Um, Hughes, to Chairman Wynn's point, you know, we could make it a five-story building, right? Um, <laughs> well, and, and, spare, height, and spare the additional, course. the height of, you know, I, yeah, so an additional, what would essentially become two additional stories in height. So just in response to your question, so it does vary by site. The other thing I really want to emphasize in talking about building height is just, this has really been studied very closely in terms of the, the way these buildings will be experienced. You know, the visual impact of these buildings, the massing, right? There's been- But can the, I, by whom? By our team in consultation uh, No, with, not, not who studied it, who, uh, experienced by whom? The, the person driving, the people in the buildings, the people on the site, how far back? Yeah, all of the above. Okay. And, and so that is why the mass of the buildings are carved away at the upper stories. So, for example, along Glen Ridge Avenue, take Building D, for example, the fifth story is stepped back 25 feet from the front of the building. That's a very significant step back. And then the sixth story is 45 feet from the front of the building. So I, that's not going to be visible from Glen Ridge Avenue, certainly. And in my experience, those are very extensive step backs that are being required at the upper portions of the building. But um, that, th th it still creates shadows, correct? Not necessarily. Well, every building creates a shadow. That's my point. And there were shadow studies done as well. Mm -hmm. Where were the shadows? Are they in the report? Or? The, well, the site submission requirements defines the different periods of the year, the solstice, equinox, and so on, and different times of the day for those, those days. Um, we've seen the preliminary studies, and the, the virtue of the sky exposure plane is that it, it works in both directions. When you're, when you're at grade looking up at the building, the building is stepping back. Similarly, if the sun is now coming back into your line of sight, that cutting away has redu effectively reduced the height of the building, and therefore the length of its shadow. Um, so, uh, and as Keenan mentioned too, the site is bowl shaped, if you will, the low point being right at the underpass, about 11 feet below the current crest of Grove. We're not saying that, uh, that fixes everything, but it means that this 88 ish feet for building a, where the supermarket is when seen from the perimeter of the site will, will be that much lower, uh, relative to where you're standing or relative to the markers near it, which would be Grove Street. At, so while we're on the issue of height, I was at the <laughs> planning board meeting. Somebody, one of the members brought up uh, similar buildings and, in terms of height, and I believe it was the hotel. This, this, this will, in effect, be the tallest. What you're proposing is the tallest within the downtown no. corridor. Yeah, that was a misrepresentation. Um, we have, is the chart on the laptop? Janice, do you think that we collected building heights for that purpose because we heard that and uh, it's 115 feet. The hotel is 115 feet. Yeah. So I can. I is. Do you know if this is this on the current laptop? 
It pro yeah, it is. I saw it on the thumb drive. Uh, so I'll just, the, the hotel is 115 feet as one example. Uh, the Siena is 80. Uh, one Seymour Street is 80. Uh, that's at the plaza corner. And then at South Willow, it's 81. Now, now you might say, how, how's that possible? I, let, I go by the, that Seymour Street project. I've been by South Willow. That can't be 80 feet. Well, in both cases, they're deploying step backs. So we're measuring 81 to the tippy top of the part of the building that's fully stepped back more in the center of the building. The hotel is an exception because it is pretty much sheer. So you see the full 115 feet of that. Um, oh, there we go. So the chart's on screen now. Yeah, certainly. So you I, know. I can't. Which? Oh. So what would be comparable to the highest building that in your plan? I, I can't see it from I would, well, I would say, uh, well, if you take building C, D, and E, the bottom group, uh, those are all a little less than the buildings at the Seymour Street project in their total overall height. But like Seymour Street, they deploy step backs. And I think most people's impression of the Seymour Street project is that it's a four-story structure. So you know, that's the, the point we're making there with building C, D, and E. C is the one that's on the west side, the freestanding building, D and E are the two on the east side. And then as discussed, you've got building A, the supermarket at 89.5, and that, you know, so okay, that's uh, about 10 feet taller than the buildings at Seymour Street, but it too, it too is deploying step backs, and that's the building that has the taller ground floor due to the supermarket. That building also is intended to have office space. And these days, floor to floors for office space are uh, very generous due to the current expectations of the marketplace. So if you have a 10 foot ceiling, there's usually a three or four foot space above that for mechanical, electrical, and so on. And then another foot for structure. So instead of a 12 foot or 11 foot floor to floor, you're going to get floor to floors that are more 13, 14, 15 feet. So that adds to the height there. Building A, I'm getting into the weeds a little bit. It's not in the redevelopment plan. Building A has parking in it as well. Um, so that's, that's to give you a sense of comparables. Yeah, building, yeah. building B at 87 uh, is, the, is on the north side of building A, but it also has step backs. So we could, you could share this information. This is from you, Janice, but your office. Yes, my table, I yes. OK, great. So we'll be able to see that. Can Thank I, you. Uh, can I ask, is this model to scale? Uh, yes. Roughly elevation? It is. Because I, you know, I'm looking at it visually. Yeah. D and E buildings dominate and dwarf the uh, residential properties to the east, uh, making them you know, it's certainly putting them in the shadow when the sun sets in the west. Uh, but it, but they just, uh, the scale such seems out of proportion. The other side, the west one, it doesn't seem to have that kind of uh, difficulty because it's going uphill and the hill, the, the grade is higher. But this one suggests, and it just sort of dominate, uh, dominates and dwarfs it. Yeah, I'm sorry you wanted to see that. So the question is, you said it's the scale. What's your response to that domination and um, out of scale? If I'm doing what you did, which is seeing the project from above, like uh, a bird or uh, from a drone, let's say, the project will look very different than if you're on the ground. And if the model circulates back to you, either one, um, I would encourage you to Hold the model as best you can up to eye level. Get yourself down on the street. And I did. Oh, you did? OK. Um, we can see here. <laughs> so I, I think that that east edge is a tricky one. Uh, I want to point out that the dwelling units there are really grouped more toward Bloomfield Avenue. So it's that one piece of Montclair Muse that I believe is going to feel an impact the most. Um, the project has a deep setback there of about 30 feet from the property line, I believe, 
Uh, it? That's correct. 30 feet from the property line shared with the Montclair Muse before you get to the face of the building, which I don't have the whole design in front of me, but yeah, after the fourth story, there's an 18 and a half foot step back. So, uh, well, the photo montages that are part of this redevelopment plan include views of that area and would reveal exactly what's what. Um, it's a tricky thing because I also should sit here and remind you that whatever the master plan does say, the current zoning is six stories for this site with much less setback requirements uh, than 30 feet. So I guess it's like a way of, you hear this from developers and applicants, this is so much better than what could be built as of right. But, but there are dramatic allowances made to minimize that impact. Yeah, I, my observation, just again, I'm looking at the model, and just saying the buildings themselves seem to occupy um, as a base the, 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 so much of the, uh, the property, mm. and then they seem, relative, they seem very high relative to the median. The west side seems uh, so much better planned and more likely to be, uh, you know, it's desirable. But we got to look at the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. The whole plan, we got to look at east and west. So here's I just a another thing occurred to me as you were describing that. The, we all, hopefully we all know or, or we're coming to know how town centers have evolved and changed and the rise of the mall and the fall of the mall and so on. The building we're talking about, uh, Building E, is it really the anomaly? By that I mean that building is slated to have retail on the ground floor at Bloomfield with a series of bays, glazed storefront bays. I'm sure the commission's really familiar with that. Uh, essentially restoring fabric to uh, help create the vibrant commercial corridor connecting to the east and the west. Uh, the Montclair Muse is really the rule breaker here, with good reason in its time. That's what the economy allowed for in terms of keeping people in the town center. Um, I'm not describing uh, one strategy is better than the other. I'm just saying that the way Building E is designed, it's sort of more the template for what you would expect on Main Street. Uh, my, my question, you know, is kind of in line with these concerns about how this is going to fit into the neighborhood. Um, but this is a, a very unique site. It's a, the most prominent site in Montclair. Um, and are we thinking about, now that we are putting significant structures on there, are they going to be signature structures that are going to stand the test of time? Mm. You know? I mean, and... and no. You know, my concern is, um, you know, concerns about trying to make it blend into the neighborhood. Are we losing something, you know, for future generations? Um, are we going to have a building that's going to look blah, that's going to get dwarfed by other developments? Yes. Um, so, well, I, I, gosh. Before you answer that, oh, I reckon I just this. say, <laughs> this is why we have 60 pages of design standards <laughs> yeah. in this plan drafted by Iris Smith. Um, I think, I think there is the possibility for that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's been most challenging for, for me in my office is not to be prescribing the outcome. I do have, in an exchange with Mr. Graham, I do have my inclinations, which is we, sh we, we should not pretend the scale is a non-issue mm -hmm. and what would it mean to make five buildings that are kind of meh or so typical that we lose some kind of opportunity. I think you're talking about is this an opportunity Absolutely. and I, I argue that it yeah. is. The plan, I didn't read it out to you, but at the very beginning of Part three of the design standards talks about design direction and asks, that requires the developer, redeveloper, to provide a statement about what this site is, what it means to the town, not just to the neighborhood around it, but the rest of the town, so that we're all on the same page about, well, are, are you, we going for even, don't even notice it kind of thing, or, well, no, we're going to mark a crossroads celebrating this 
critical transit point. Anything you have to say is, is, is helpful in that regard. Um, it relates back to the historic elements in a funny way, and this is not a great way to design. The designers who are up on this platform know this. The, working around the historic elements, exposing them, mm -hmm. leaving view sheds to them and so on, kind of backs you into certain decisions about where mask wants to be and where it doesn't want to be. It's not the best way to design, but it sometimes produces results that are unexpected and kind of allow you to have your cake and eat it too. Uh, that's just my way of saying, you may be looking at the design saying, well, it seems uh, half a step shy of being as memorable and eternal as it ought to be, and really there should be a stronger statement about that. But as uh, collaborators on this, it didn't seem like our role to necessarily say that. Mm -hmm. But if you, as a body, think that's important, then in partnership with you know, preserving the historic elements, leads you down a path, that, that would be good to hear, good mm -hmm. to know. Mm -hmm. Something we could add here. I think that is, you know, agreed. That's an interesting mm -hmm. point, Jason, that we want a, a, an exciting opportunity here, buildings to stand the test of time. Uh, but I think we also want them in conjunction and uh, in, in a way that doesn't overwhelm and dwarf the historic Lackawanna Plaza building, right? So um, one of the things we talk about here often is, not, is the um, buildings that we're adding on to the historic buildings don't overwhelm it. So I was, uh, would ask if you could speak to um, it, what steps you would see to make sure that the because uh, from the visuals that we see, I, I know that uh, we had a discussion at the planning board meeting about getting more visuals to better understand the scale, better understand the size, how Lackawanna Plaza would look in conjunction with these other buildings uh, from a size standpoint. Um, but I was wondering if you'd speak to the, uh, if there are plans or there are discussions to make sure that it's highlighted and not dwarfed by the new buildings that come in. I can only give you one example. Um, mm -hmm. The, the dwarfing question is, uh, it, it's, there's a lot of trial and error and iterative designing that leads to you know, making a building either feel heavy or light, whether it's a short building or a tall building. You know? The one example I'll give you though, which may help in, in, in understanding what's been discussed on that matter, uh, I'll, I'll bring up an, ish, an image. I'm having fun. I know Janice and a bunch of you have had a really long week, but I'm gonna, I'll just make this point. So, um, we can go all night, Mr. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the waiting room. I mean, that's the jewel in the crown, the waiting room. And I've talked about, maybe it's a little easier if I'm on this side. Uh, I've talked about, we've got the supermarket here. You, you can see some signage at this scale since I've enlarged it. Parking deck for the time is contemplated as sitting above. Large glazed wall here, why? For those of you who've shopped in a supermarket that uh, is contiguous with a mall-like condition, sometimes it's parking above, you often will see stairs or escalators. It's a wayfinding device, it can be very dramatic uh, and help people find you know, their way toward the front door if they're in a deck uh, find their way to this space because it's daylit down to the market. One of the important conversations we've had, which has not been pursued, it's more of a site plan issue, is you know, how do you really deal with screening a couple floors of parking? And what we suggested to the redeveloper is to think of this not as much as a building, but as an opportunity for art or a sculptural element. Something I think that could riff off of the character or amount of detailing we see in the waiting room, or it could be a contrasting modern piece. Uh, there have recently been some very exciting glazed parking decks. One could imagine introducing 
uh, reflective glass, prismatic glass at angles that actually kind of break the light and color of this because there'll be reflected light, you know, into the public realm and it'll screen the parking deck and it'll break down the mass of this building. These are the kind of under the hood conversations we have with the redeveloper, but uh, the more dramatic solution, of course, is to say, well, can, the, can you just not have the mass up here so that the part of the building that's against or, or nearest the waiting room is closer in scale? I mean, that would be a very forceful way of getting them to talk closer to each other. But I do think the judicious application of certain finishes or uh, treatments can do a lot for breaking down building mass beyond just the carving away of mass. And, and that, that, this is a delicate area for sure. Um, you just touched on something, materiality. In the concept, what is your overall concept of materials and color, too? Well, as I mentioned, the, uh, the, all the design standards allow for is what's consistent with the Secretary of the Interior's recommendations, that new construction be compatible with and often it's in the case of uh, historic structure, just one, uh, compatible with the historic structures that are being added to or adjacent to. Mm -hmm. We have five buildings here, and the design standards, in the same spirit of not wanting to dictate to the developer, but rather have the developer and their architect design the best buildings they can, there's a range of design styles that are shown from more traditional to more modern that we ask the redeveloper to deploy, but using the best examples of those we can think of, that's another area where the commission may feel, you know, maybe there are even better examples of these different styles than what we've shown in the redevelopment plan. When we talk about compatibility, because of the nature of the surrounding site, like I can't tell you uh, wood is preferred or steel or glass is preferred because the context em employs all of those. Certainly on site, the dominant materials are brick, um, a kind of precast concrete with the aggregate showing and that's the waiting room and uh, steel. Um, but I think uh, to another point the planning board chair made, if, if we were to make all five buildings out of the same stuff, we suddenly have a, a star at city or a kind of corporate campus. Now, some of you may be suddenly, oh, corporate campus, that's what we need in Montclair. And, you know, but we don't recommend any particular outcome. We just point out the importance of uh, maintaining a high level of standard and detailing uh, and scaling of the buildings and the choice of materials. Is, it's a wide range right now. I just have questions. I'll keep my com. I have lots of comments, but I just have questions. Um, you use this statement, bowl shape, to describe the site. When I read the, um, and to justify some additional height, when I look at the actual numbers on the site, to me it reads pretty flat. And that the only difference is this overpass that goes up and down. But the rest of the site goes from 240 across the site to 236. Yes, but I don't really read a bowl shape there. To me, it's pretty, maybe slightly sloping from west to east. Is, am I wrong or is you, missing you, something? I, I would never want to call you wrong, Mr. Reimnitz, <laughs> um, but you're wrong. Oh. Um, in this way, in this way. The, the part of the site that's deepest right now is, is covered over by a building. At the southwest corner and the southeast corners were 246 on the sidewalk. At the Grove underpass were 236. So forget, forget the crest of Grove. Just forget that. There's a 10-foot difference between the southeast and southwest corners and the low point of the site, which is presently you know, not visible. So I understand today, if you were looking at the site and certainly looking at a scaled model, it's hard to appreciate. I'm not saying, we're not saying it's a deep bowl, but there is a bowl-like effect going on, and I, I think it's real. Okay. Um, 
Did I hear you s make the comment that Building C has the same footprint as the waiting station? Uh, similar. It's, it is larger, maybe by about 15 to 20 percent. I notice a comment, and this is more of a general question. I see all these images and your exterior ground. Where are, do we have those images? Are those, are those become part of this? Or this uh, is just no. to show possibly what could be right. done? Right, right. These are part of a group of much larger images, some of which have similar designs and some that are different, which are generated on the way to memorializing what everyone agrees would make give for a good plan some sense to give people a thought. sense. Right. And okay. what I'm showing you does comport with what's in the redevelopment plan. Like this is consistent. But not necessarily shall. It, yeah, I, I notice this shall and should. And that when I look at, and I notice out of all of this, there's only two pages that relate to historic preservation, 35 and 36, that all of 35 is should. Which, which, stanchions shall remain so I think all the ones that I've described as becoming visible to the public and enlivening the public space the station plaza okay shall so shall and I I don't know uh, if so that we could work memorialized in this plan as shall as opposed to yes shall. that's the kind of feedback Okay. If you guys just, are that's just a question. Uh, okay. concerned, that's the kind of feedback we need, yeah. yeah. So shall applies to the uh, waiting room building. Right. Even so though it says should in there. It says should. It says should be preserved. And now we get into, not more under the hood, but a different part of the conversation. As you all know, and Tom certainly knows, within the world of historic preservation, you have four distinct approaches to historic preservation. Has this been discussed much at the commission, Tom? The, okay. So you've got, uh, I, may need, I may need help, but there's rehabilitation, which is usually associated with what people call adaptive reuse. Um, and you've got restoration, which is usually referring to genuine historic fabric that you are putting back or restoring to its original condition using as close as you can original historic materials and methods. So you got rehabilitation, restoration, recreation, one of them, right? That's rarely used. Reconstruction. Uh, reconstruction. Reconstruction is when you don't have the historic fabric, but you have a, a little bit, enough of the DNA to convincingly recreate what's missing. Uh, and then the preservation. Preservation. Repair. Repair. Repair, right. Repair. Now, this project actually is doing a little bit of all of them. And the, uh, if we had more time, which we have now, I would want to go through and perhaps not say should be preserved, but shall be preserved with a small p in a manner consistent with protection and rehabilitation, if we're talking about the waiting room, so that, with a capital R <laughs> on the rehabilitation. So um, that's kind of what's missing from this. We were reluctant to draw that line. There's a lot to work on to get to this point. We were reluctant to start divvying up well, what really is a recreation, what's really being restored, what's actually being rehabilitated, but um, yeah. Yeah, I guess in the end, we'll see a plan, right? We'll respond to what's being presented. But um, just, I just have a couple more questions. Okay. I, I want to comment on things. Um, what is the uh, turnaround? What, what is the vehicular uh, intention for the turnaround in the main plaza off of Bloomfield Avenue? What, what's purpose? Do so that, does right. that serve? The intention for this supermarket was to provide parking that people need for a vehicle, but not have it off of Bloomfield Avenue, and yet to make it possible for people to uh, be dropped off or picked up in front of the supermarket. If you don't have a car, for example, maybe you're Ubering, 
uh, maybe your so it's not parking for the super. It's park. It's short term. It's uh, yes. Thank you. Short term convenience parking. Kind of parking. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, that's described on page thirty mm -hmm. of the redevelopment plan. Okay. The, great. The vision for that space. There's another part of this as I was reading this is impervious uh, versus pervious, and that the existing impervious is eighty eight percent, I believe, and. Yeah. This says not to exceed 88%, yeah. and then that uh, pervious includes percolating pavement and so on. Is and it's a little deceiving to me. And here's a comment. Yes. Uh, that I see green here. Yes. To me, I read green. I go, oh, green trees, green grass, but that's not what it says. It says. You know, this could all be paved with joints in it that allow pervious, and it's just open space. It's not green space per se. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. It's difficult for a developer uh, at this stage, redeveloper, to design to that finished level to know exactly what percentage would be hardscape versus softscape. The, the choice of green, you're not the first person to question that use. It's, it's a, merely a convention to no. say open space yes i guess that would be a question do would you think that some amount of space should be well, green grass and trees as opposed to just open space yes i mean okay. we do want to maximize the amount of actual green space on the site but the way that these open spaces are envisioned as gathering spaces programmable event spaces they're going to be mostly hardscape and we've talked about this with the redeveloper. I mean, we've looked very closely at the coverage calculations, and it looks like we'll be able to basically match the existing. But believe it or not, as much open space as there is envisioned in this plan, it, a lot of it's got to be hardscape. So it's really going to be about incorporating more green infrastructure, more pervious pavement to sort of accomplish those objectives. Got it. I have one last question which relates to building D and E. It looks like the whole site sits on a platform that is one story. Did you consider to help break down the massing of those two? Even though it's called two buildings, it becomes one big building with a space in between that's not, ex you know, did you, what is the use of that one story space between those two buildings? That's actually the primary pedestrian entry for residents. So if you're walking home, there are smaller residential lobbies potentially on Bloomfield and Glen Ridge if you're coming from the train station. But if you are just want to hang out in the linear park or go to the supermarket, that one story part of that base or plinth, that is your main lobby coming and going into the two buildings. Yeah, it's a parking podium, essentially. So the parking that serves both of those. Yeah, the great, the greater part of that base so is filled with parking. Yes, yeah. behind the active you, retail uh, lobby, et cetera, there will be parking. Okay, those are my questions. Thank you. I, oh, go ahead. Um, I have a question going back to Ira's um, description of the train's shed and it being opened up. Um, when you said opened up, do you mean like, I know that it was enclosed in the 80s as part of the mall. Is it going to be just open for the supermarket or is it going to be actually open to the um, plaza? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, I realize without a visual it's hard to describe. I think be it's similar to the east side of the supermarket where the station plaza is. The supermarket uh, is probably going to need a solid wall yeah. on the west side as well. Um, when you remove the interventions from the 80s, you're kind of left with a, an arcade space, mm -hmm. sort of steel columns. And uh, What's been discussed is that the arcade space would be there, but that the eastern edge of it would be a solid wall, and that's another opportunity for integration of art or, or cultural information about the site. Again, not sure if that ends up in the waiting room or not, but mm -hmm. the intent is not to allow it just to be a blank wall and, um, 
enliven it with some kind of cultural programming in, in that arcade space. Yeah. So um, a follow-up to that, and uh, this is going to be a, a tough ask, considering yeah, the other that's where the vehicle been so easy, circulation so. for the buildings are going to be. <laughs> but is there a way that you can uh, enhance the connection between the main plaza, the, um, the historic waiting room, and the Greenwood Avenue Triangle Parklet, so that, you know, because, you know, at least towards the east, there's a lot of uh, really well thought design in terms of making it pedestrian and people friendly to get to that area, but then. You know, there's that little parklet. That, yes, you know, we I, would this like actually to, to as well. I appreciate your comment. So this is actually going to be easier for me than I, uh, <laughs> I was concerned. Um, you you are one of a few people who've asked about that, mm -hmm. and I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, it would help tremendously if if the commission agreed with you. If you could memorialize that. Mm -hmm. um, we can, we can, to date, that particular path has not been well defined, mm -hmm. but it's come up repeatedly. Yeah. And I, I would like to see it as well. I think whether you're walking by the north edge of the waiting room or, or, or entering into it because it's open and available to get you east to west, um, something there seems really uh, helpful, practical, but also doing that thing of connecting the pieces, which right now are kind of all broken mm -hmm. apart. So your input and um, encouragement on that matter would help. Yeah. And I, since it is a redevelopment plan, there's a bit more flexibility. My thought, it, you know, just off the bat, is stealing some space from the right of way, eliminating the street parking to just have a more prominent sidewalk or right, greenway. Right. Yes, that's a, you're right to the, identify uh, that. Do you have a building in front to the east of the uh, waiting room, the historic? Other than what's been discussed, or? No, it looks as though from this model yeah. and what's up there that the roof or the, this, the building, the historic building, is set into, is, is yeah, I think you described it as being uh, removed from or creating more space in between those buildings, the, right? Or how is that? In the in in the latest no. version of the plans, the waiting room is not physically attached to the building, just to its north, Behi except for a to lobby To the north. Connected. Well, what about to the east? That lower building. Oh, you're. That, that's I, the existing building. Yeah, the thermal or the gabled part that's taller doesn't span the full width of the waiting room. The part that's got the one story. Right, and then appearance. there's sheds that come off. There, yeah, yeah. That's shed. all that's all there now. That's that's where the kitchen is, for example, for Pig and Prince. That's right. So that's not new. That's that's there and would remain. Oh, okay. That it, it gives a different impression. So yeah. what is the uh, in percentage wise, what is what you're calling open space in percentage to what the built space on eight and a half acres? How much open space percentage-wise? Because I understand yeah. what I'm hearing now. It's the, what you're yeah. saying. It's a trade-off with height to open space. So yeah, we've collected that. I, uh, yeah, Keenan I mean, and Janice. Uh, the plan requires seventy-two thousand square feet of open space. Based on eight and a half acres. Eight point two. So yeah, that's one point six five acres. Yeah, roughly. One point six acres on. 8.2. Is that, is that a formula that's consistent with other developments of this size? A formula that's consistent? Well, you're saying you're offering more open space. I mean, I, mean, I guess I think in, in well, your yeah. world, you could build on everything, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, well, that's the I'm question, thinking. right? The question is, like, what's the trade-off for, you know, agreeing to make concessions? So yeah. I, I agree with the chair's point. Is there a standard? And I guess the answer, it's no, we make it up. It's yeah. Well, I, I, it would be interesting to yeah. look at what the as of right or supposedly as of right site plan application was under the existing zoning in terms of overall building coverage. Yeah. I don't know if you recall that, but. I don't. I it, don't know. In the town it center. It certainly wasn't 70,000 square feet of open space. Right. 
in the in the town center, like like they're saying, it's typical to build to your uh, lot line with a modest setback, often on all sides. So it's going to be close to zero is what's typical. That's why it was such a big deal in New York when uh, it was mandated, or, or, or well, first it was mandated the building should be set back, I think, and then there was a trade-off made. You could build higher as long as you protected the sky exposure plane and suddenly buildings decided, well, I still want the sheer look, but I'll put a plaza in front of my building. So this, it's, it's been a, I would, gosh, I would say probably since, probably since the advent of elevators and structural steel, the question of uh, why shouldn't we fill the whole block has been out there. There's no standard solution. Different cities, towns come up with their own approach. And, and of course, our site's loaded with historic elements that kind of want to their own uh, shoulder space. Um, so, so speaking about the historic elements, the um, stanchions that you said would be in what you were calling Station Plaza, you show them uh, uh, in the presentation without the uh, butterfly canopies. And I asked you about this at yes. Hillside right. because you had wires strung across. Right. And so if they're remaining there, then why are you removing the uh, concrete element? So the drawing you're looking at is a product of the redevelopment team, the, the, the redevelopers team modeling the whole site. And um, it's hearsay, and I believe even Chair Wynn has, has reported this, that there are condition issues with those butterfly wings. And I know that uh, that's something that has to be looked into. So my, this is an early, earlier study. My answer to you today is probably the same as it was then, which is that the coverage for those elements is really to be determined. But certainly when I first saw the open arbor, as charming as it was, I, I immediately said, I, I don't think that's happening, certainly not from stanchion to stanchion because you're exposing the stanchions to risk. You know, you could potentially reuse the concrete wings if they're still there and viable, or rebuild them. Uh, the idea is to make it an inviting park that has that is sunlit. Uh, so I think the redevelopment team is trying to find the right balance, which is why I mentioned maybe, let's say the roofs are 50% no good, maybe some remain and the others are rebuilt as kind of glazed elements. Um, but to retain yeah. the yeah. concrete, uh, yep. the concrete butterfly, what, how will you determine whether or not they're salvageable and you can use them as, it, as they exist now without the added protection of the so mall, but use it as they were you know, in, the, in a historic way? So my understanding is that what's happened over time is that these concrete shells, I'm going to call them, have, have gotten roofing, different layers of roofing. And not only that, but they're receiving much more water, water than they used to because those shells were extended with skylights. So you've got a lot of water ponding on top of these shells with layers of roofing which uh, have become cracked and damaged over time and haven't seen, so I've heard, a good maintenance program, which means there's water potentially infiltrated into the surface of the concrete rusting out rebar. And uh, only, only the exposure of all, you know, the removal of all that roofing, the exposure of these uh, concrete shells is going to tell us if they're in terrible condition or good condition. They may, they may reveal themselves, some of them, to be in amazing condition and quite beautiful, in which case I would imagine the design decision should be made based on, you know, how much, how much of this can we retain, should we retain. But it's, it's just impossible to know right now to commit to, um, I mean, unless it's impossible to commit to any particular direction, suffice it to say that the, the plan accounts for protecting the historic elements before, during, and after the project is completed. Uh, and then, you know, there, there's, there's going to be this phase of discovery to determine what's really there and how it can be worked with. And um, the glazed tile that are on the, um, the uh, head of the, the tracks, I just went by today, 
at or a couple of days ago, but the glazing is has is coming off of that. Is there any is intention on the owner to or the developer, whoever owns it, to have some kind of maintenance program to keep up what's are the elements, the historic elements that exist that so we don't have a, another case of uh, demolition by neglect? So are, just to be clear, are you referring to the roof tiles at the terminal shed? Yes. Yeah, the redeveloper is aware of that. And, you know, uh, we probably haven't done enough in terms of uh, specifying the treatment for that roof, for example. But, but the, the conversation has been that that roof is to be retained with matching materials where needed, uh, as opposed to patching in with something that's not compatible or the same. So, like, I'm glad you're mentioning that because uh, it could appear in your memo, but I, I, I think it's the additional kind of um, attention we're looking for, you know. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Yeah. Um I see these various different areas and buildings, and they don't seem to be really that connected yet. Um, like from the entrance in Lackawanna Plaza to the station plaza, it just seems to be a block dropped in there. And I was wondering if there's thought about continuing on the theme of the, the, the stanchions, maybe not you using the stanchions, but the rhythm and things like that to show how that Lackawanna Plaza connected to the stanchions that you're going to see on the other side of the building. And I would like to see, and it seems to me that all these buildings are kind of just dropped in place. They don't seem to relate to each other. Mm. Well, there's no project yet, though. I mean, oh, we're I talking about just no massing project. at this it's point. Massing, so it's, just, it's the location of the buildings that's yeah, significant I mean, to the yeah. redevelopment plan. I mean, I'm, I'm colored by what I see, and oops. So. Testing? Okay. Yes. So you were, the first point was about this connection from the main plaza, let's call it, to the station plaza, I think, right? right. And articulating right. that in a way that makes you more connect. aware of what the pre-existing right. condition was. Right. And also, on the west side of the building, the Lackawanna. Terminal shed side. Terminal shed side it just stops. You've got building A in there. Is there any ideas of thought about continuing something in, in within the building? Yeah, I think you're putting your finger on an important aspect of the project with, with this many buildings, which some of which connect to each other, but which also shape these outdoor rooms, I think edges and corners of buildings. Mm -hmm in and of themselves, but then how they relate to the historic uh, coexisting Why element. It be, that, <laughs> no, you're right. That, those can be some of the most exciting moments when you yeah. feel that tension between something historic that is uh, talking to, near to, or gently kissing you know, the new thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I, for sure that's a site, that there's a site plan. Um, development piece, but we can add language that ensures that those moments are appropriately developed and, and recognized, celebrated uh, right. in, the, in the redevelopment plan language. Yeah, that's, thank you, I think that's right. And actually you, you uh, cite that on page 35, a standard, the Secretary of, Seri uh, Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, number two and number nine, which speaks to uh, spatial relationships, alteration of features, spacious, spaces, and spatial relationships that characterize a property will be avoided. And also at number nine, 
which you've made a point, new work will be differentiated from the old and will be compatible with the historic materials, scale, size, and proportion. So that, I think, we're a little off here. Where are you reading that from again? Secretary of Interior Standards, Rehabilitation. Oh, you're, a, you're not in the plan. You're reading that. Well, no, you, you uh, I'm sorry, you don't cite the plan. You mentioned you, the secretary. The plan calls for careful management of these historic elements, and all such work should be performed in accordance with the rehabilitation guidelines. Right. Okay, so these are the real big rehabilitation guidelines. I, I was looking for the language here. Could, could you just read back what you were On number from? two and number yeah. nine, which I think uh, is pertinent to our discussion now. Yes. Uh, historic character of a property will be retained and preserved. The removal of distinctive materials or alteration of features, spaci spaces, and spatial relationships that characterize the property will be avoided. To and me, that's, that's consistent with what I think Commissioner Rooney was referring to, that we're more intentional about the historic pieces versus newer pieces, and that there's not a muddying. But then when you drop down to number nine, which I agree with, the new work will be differentiated from the old, but the next part is will be compatible with the historic materials, features, size, scale, and proportion, and massing to protect the integrity of the property and its environment. So I think when you're in these critical area, the most critical area, which is where the waiting room is, and then here, you know, when you look into the train sheds, and also on the, uh, here, which I just spoke about Lackawanna Plaza. Yeah. I mean, those seem to be the three crucial areas that um, we really are looking at. Sure. Well, I mean, I heard a should in there, but because, and I'm not making light, because it's hard to get all of those things at once. I think in this project, a lot of those characteristics will be possible. The, the last what, point what that you read. What does a lot mean? <laughs> How many is a lot? Is it <laughs> features, <laughs> materials, scale, proportion? Uh, it, it's impossible to give you, you know, a, a straight answer. But I think those guidelines were written to at least point all of us. They're written. They're federal, you know, uh, guidelines that apply at the state and then the local levels uh, to steer us all in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, I think the historic elements are so distinctive and of their time that it will, in a way, be almost I don't want to say easier, but it will be very possible to achieve that level of distinction and compatibility based on materiality. You know, the, material, the materials on site are very suggestive, and yet if you use them in a different form at a different scale, you, you're finding a way to echo or relate while establishing that distinction that those guidelines are talking about. Um, so if there are any other comments or questions, I think what we sh should define the historic elements now. Go ahead. I have one question. It just relates to the uh, that uh, one-way vehicle loop through the uh, main plaza. Yeah. And which, I um, understand, it has two lanes: a parking lane and a travel lane. Uh, will there be a capacity to, uh, capability of shutting it off, as in bollards or otherwise, so that it, you'd have effectively a green with the the station plaza and the. Uh, Maybe yeah, plaza. absolutely, absolutely. The visuals are uh, a little bit hard to see, but they actually uh, do show bollards, and that, that's our intention. I think the redevelopment plan cites the bollards as well uh, okay. as a way to shut off entry for vehicles. Um, yeah. Thank so you. I couldn't find that word. Okay. Say again? Are we mandating retractable bollards? But I'm just a follow-up sure. question on yeah, that. That's really a, a site plan issue, I would say. But, you know, if that makes sense, I mean, I, that's yeah. something to require, sure. Otherwise, you expect an almost constant stream of traffic going through there. You have short-term parking and a supermarket where people are going to drop off, pick up, and do it. So, so fairly constant traffic through that area. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Then can we um, identify the 
uh, historic elements. So we have the waiting room building. Uh, we have the terminal shed, which is the, the uh, on, uh, front side on Lackawanna Plaza. We have the train station canopies and steel, steel structures, which we've been speaking about as the stanchions. Uh, we have the, the watering trough, the concrete stairs, the balustrade and railing, and then the six masonry piers that are on the perimeter of the uh, property. And what we haven't really discussed is the view shed, um, but that uh, entails the building that you've proposed on the corner of the... Uh, I would add the site boundary. The site, uh, and yeah, the, the site... historic site boundary. Oh, okay, good. I, I'd like to add another thing, and just for the Commission's consideration, and then we can talk about it at our next meeting, but um, uh, including the dome on the east side of the parcel as a historic element. It's not historic in the sense that it's original, but it's a part of the site's history. It's characteristic of the development of the site. Oh. Um, and it's a... Uh, it's a bit of a um, microcosm of the development of American retail throughout the years, you know, the conversion mm. of the train station to, uh, you know, an enclosed mall, very Americana, uh, and <laughs> now being eliminated uh, in favor of, you know, mixed-use retail. Um, and it, I, I think it, we should consider whether that is an element that we want to mm. preserve on the mm. site, because it is part of Montclair's history and you know 50 it's 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 a grand structure and 50 years from now uh, you know future generations are going to be like wow that's really cool. and we're almost 40 we're almost 40, 40, yeah. years. We're we're like 40 oh now so <laughs> good god yeah I, I I think it's important to to remember that right now we are making history because the decisions that we make mm -hmm. especially with these signature structures are going to be around way longer than we are so uh, I think it's something to consider do you have an image of, you don't have an image of that thing just the aerial I'll bring it up <laughs> Could be a little temple to Diana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's right. something we think we, I think we need to have talk amongst yeah, we'll have yeah. discussion. <laughs> <laughs> discussion about that. <laughs> um, yeah. Any other questions? No. Do you want to wrap it up then? Well. I'll make an attempt, but Director Talley may be better suited to this. I think that um, for, for us, certainly, and I'm sure for the planning board, uh, your vigilance, your experience thinking about historic elements and their treatment will matter a lot, maybe the most. So I just want to make sure that you do spend time going through the elements that you just listed and provide, you know, the the most detailed feedback you can provide um, in terms of what shall and what should. I apologize that uh, I'm a little rusty on the, the four facets of uh, historic preservation. I'm happy to get that information to her. Tom can get it to you. But the, one of the uh, things you find on any historic site that you are working on is that it's rarely just uh, rehabilitation. Sometimes you are not just doing a an adaptive reuse and it's very straightforward. You're often recreating some missing molding or a column that got removed that you want to put back, which is, uh, you know, a recreation. Um, so if you can be mindful of that, that would help a lot. Um, we, you know, we can, we can as well provide the extra shadings if that's appropriate, but I just want to make sure in addition to whatever sort of town planning considerations you may have uh, in relationship to the context that you do focus 
your quality time on uh, those historic elements and their treatment. Tom, do you have any th any uh, remarks to make at this point, or or should we wait to hear? I, I actually have a lot, but uh, <laughs> um, uh. is be before tonight's meeting, though. I went back and and pulled up the memo that I generated for the planning board back, believe mm -hmm. it or not, on December 17, 2018, almost four years ago tonight. And there are two sentences that I would like to read that are probably the most important. Um, the train station, inclusive of the sheds and stanchions and the site is listed on the New Jersey and National Register of Historic Places and is locally designated as a landmark. Such designations are not to be taken lightly and are based on the history and development of the site and the level of integrity, including the value of adaptive reuse. So that's kind of a, just a guiding overall mm. right. principle of how we should be looking at this site. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think uh, the, your, your comments have been very valuable and I really appreciate the time and the feedback that you can provide uh, into the plan. So I hope we can make this a seamless process uh, and that we can be successful this time around because we've been working on this forever. Mm -hmm. So thank Tom, you. Uh, just uh, quickly, Tom, I, I don't think, I mean, we're not gonna have these opportunities very often. Is there anything else that you think is important that we should uh, address at this meeting because the next meeting you know we've really kind of committed to putting pen to paper right so I think uh, you know if the thing that, that concerns yeah. me the most is the view shed um, the view shed the historic view shed has been altered by building a and C um, the scale and size of those buildings dwarfs the historic station waiting room mm-hmm um, the view shed from Bloomfield Avenue and Grove Street are probably the most um, public views. Um, the name of the site is Lackawanna Plaza, and we've partially built on half of the plaza. I think that, those are just my. Those are extremely first important comments. points. And today, they're very Tom. important, yes. Extremely important points. Okay, if that's it, thank you. Uh, we thank you for your thank time you. and look thank forward you. to your feedback. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. you can take
the, you can just the summarize and say our windows in the yet, yet, yet. Are we on? Are we on? Okay. Okay. I'm just so pull up here. our break is break is over. <laughs> uh, you just had we are now on. moving on to um, HPC application 2022-44, 348 to 360 Bloomfield uh, Avenue. Uh, this yeah. is a, a window replacement and master master signage plan. So this building at 348 to 360 Bloomfield Avenue was built in 1923. It's considered a contributing building in the uh, 2003 um, expansion for e e expansion historic district for the town center, and it sits at the southern corner of Bloomfield Avenue and South Willow Street. And what you are proposing to do is change windows, and there's a master signage plan. So, if you could um, tell us, show us. Uh, sorry. Uh, do you swear to say the whole truth and oh, nothing but the truth? <laughs> Can you state your name for the record? Yeah, and state Ryan your name. Ryan Robertson. Okay. And your connection to the applicant? Uh, the architect. Architect. All right. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're going to give this commission be truthful and accurate? I do. All right. Duly sworn. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members of the board. Um, let's see. I'm going to pull up. I'm going to toggle between the, um, the file drawings that you have and then also some of the photos that are in the planning report here. Is there a way to zoom in easily on this or not really? Okay, pinch. That's good enough, I think. If you move it around there, the little thing will pop up at the bottom. I see. Great. So we're here tonight uh, proposing to replace second floor windows on this building, as the chair stated. And we're also proposing a master sign scheme, which will give some cohesion to the future signage on this building. Um, there are existing wall signs on the first floor tenants, and there will be um, projecting blade signs for the second floor businesses. So the applicant's goal is to replace this, all the second floor windows here in order to improve the facade and to also improve the spaces to attract business tenants. Doing so in the manner we propose, we'll do a couple things that'll eliminate all these, the need for these window AC units that you can see along Bloomfield, which are um, a little unappealing. Um, and also the design will <clears throat> provide a more harmonious composition of the windows in each bay here, which we'll go over. down here you can see in this image there are bays of aluminum windows between each of these several carved limestone pilasters uh, but the existing window configuration is kind of disjointed and not attractive as you can see for instance this is like a, an a a b a a configuration whereas the window right next to it is almost the same size but it's a b b b a hmm. and it's not really clear to me why that was done um, there's no interior partitions in the locations that would demand this. But there's a historic photo that Tommy was able to find for us. Oh, second page. It's great. Page down. So this is the uh, oh. historic photo. And you can see it had these existing bays had three windows each with the center window being slightly larger. And also take note, historically this had transom windows, which I'll point out something in the existing building. As you proceed along around the corner here on South Willow, sorry, this is not clicking for me. There we go. You can see around the corner, the same windows continue here, um, but the limestone stops and you have brick. And so you can also see, this is a little hard to see right here, but it's easy to see here. 
the existing window opening, this is where the transom would have been. And what exists here is corrugated metal hmm. in those transom locations and a sort of stucco panel above these ones. It seems that that was done in order to create a drop ceiling, which exists. And so the applicant would like to provide heating and cooling within that drop ceiling so that we can remove the window AC units. So that means we would like to propose the window heights stay um, in what exists right now rather than the historical height. Next page. Gosh, I should go to this instead. On the south side, this photo, there exists one bay with three windows, which we also propose to replace. And on the roof, there's a couple elevations. There's the right around this corner faces east. There's some double hung windows. And this side right here faces south. And there's also some double hung windows, which you'll see in the club. And, and you're changing all of those? All of the, everything on the second floor. Okay. That's right. Get a little closer. So here we can see the <coughs> Bloomfield elevation and the South Willow elevation. Mm -hmm. So the proposed north elevation, this is Bloomfield, calls for fixed aluminum windows on the second floor. There's no proposed new lighting, but there exists lighting on each of these pilasters right here. You can see it's kind of like a coffee can light in black. And these proposed second floor windows will all be powder coated, black thermal break aluminum windows with a three quarter inch frame depth, uh, one inch double pane insulated glass and heavy duty extrusions. And as usual, we can submit specs and cut sheets if, if this application is granted approval. Um, we propose to install equally spaced windows in each bay here. You can see some with four equal windows like in the first bay and um, to the left. And then in the center bay, which is wider, five equal windows, which kind of works out to be roughly the same size. Around the corner on South Willow, you can see there are three bays per window, or three windows per bay. And we, um, until we get to a change in floor height, it might be hard to see the dashed line, but you can see the windows jump up a little bit. And so this section of the facade kind of feels a little independent. We propose a slightly different um, look here, which is where we have a double hung here and a double hung here and then fixed windows with the intermediate bar to kind of mimic that height and tie it all together. Uh, all the first floor storefronts are to remain across here and here, but we propose to paint them black. Um, we also have some existing corrugated infill here and here, which we propose to paint black. A couple random openings in the brick facade, we would paint those black as well, as well as this horizontal siding area with the doors to kind of tie everything in together with the second floor. Next page of the submitted drawings shows the south facade as well as the roof facades. And so here's the triple window here. We're proposing two um, fixed units and one operable casement. No scope on the first floor down here. It's existing infill. And here is the facade facing east with three double hungs. We propose new double hungs. And then my understanding is to the south, these windows have been replaced more recently and they don't require replacement. So those would stay the same. That can't be seen from the street or the parking lot anyway. And go to the planning memo. That kind of sums up what we're proposing for the window. So I'll talk a little bit about the signage proposal, which is more of like a master sign program. Um, it's twofold to improve the, the wall signs here, which exist in the sort of sign band, and then to propose projecting blade signs at each of these pilasters. So you can see the Bloomfield Ave facade has a mix of existing signage. Some of the colors you can't really tell in this photo unless you zoom in, but they don't exactly quite match. Um, some of the heights don't exactly align, so we'd like to propose a scheme that would eventually replace what exists, which tenants would comply with as new signage gets replaced and submitted for individual sign permits. 
Um, I'll just, this won't take long, so I'll just quickly go over the code sections. Um, each first floor business is allowed one square feet per linear foot of frontage per 347-110.1. And the frontages vary on each of these, so we'd like to propose that the max height of the sign is 18 inches, and then the width would vary so that each, each sign length could vary slightly as needed to comply so that they're not more than one square foot, and 18 inches would get that done. Um, these signs would be located and centered in the established sign band, which would make sure that they all align nicely in the future. There would be one outlier sign on uh, around the corner. Oh, I should do the drawings for that one. We just approved that. The, the poke, the poke, mm -hmm. three sixty. Oh, uh, I'm referring to a different sign, but oh. um, this sign here. I thought it was around the corner as well. Yeah, that one is around the corner as well. There is a poke 360. Um, there's a, a tenant space here with three garage doors. This is a, a wall sign that was, is kind of an outlier because there's no established sign band. Oh. So the description of this sign, which is um, sign number nine on our schedule and on the elevations, this also complies with the code. Um, it's shown 48 inches high by 57 inches wide, which is 19 square feet. Whereas because of the frontage, 62 square feet would be allowed. Um, since there is no sign band here, the ordinance says it has to be set higher than seven feet. And so we set it at the bottom of this soldier course, which sets it at six, seven foot eight. So that would comply. Um, the ordinance also states in 347-107.3 that the wall signs above seven feet, which is um, all our signs, shall not project more than eight inches and the signs should be of similar shape, size, color, and height. And so we propose to comply with both of those. Um, the signs will be less than eight inches deep and we could have consistently colored steel, aluminum, or composite back panels with formed plastic individual letters, uh, color to be determined. In addition, uh, the submitted plans include a few other miscellaneous sign type locations like directory signs, parking signs, and window signs, all of which comply with zoning as mentioned in the planning report. Now back for the projecting signs. You can really see, well, I'll go to the other page. Here you can see each of the projecting signs located on the pilaster. Uh, starting on the second pilaster from the left, these uh, seven would advertise for each of the seven individual second floor business tenant spaces that exist up there. And um, on the west elevation, the planning report actually says that we call for one, but we, we call for two, so I'll point that out, the discrepancy. Number 17 and 18 are the two projecting signs we propose here. Number 17 is intended for the corner tenant because they're allowed to, because they have two frontages. Number 18 is intended for the, the tenant over here with the three garage doors, which we consulted with the township to make sure a blade sign would be allowed to advertise for a first floor tenant. And they said we would be able to, um, it would be compliant. And it would be nice for that tenant over here to get some visibility for vehicular traffic on Bloomfield. So we propose it to be right here, which is not associated with this window, it's associated with that tenant. So 18 and nine would be the same tenant? Um, 17 and 18 would be the same tenant right here and right here on and the who, corner. And what tenant is 9, the one on the, on the wall? Uh, 9 is the wall sign for the, the three garage doors. This is the blade sign for the same tenant. Yeah, that's the same tenant, yeah. yes. Oh, okay. sorry. That I was my question. You. Okay. And so all these projecting signs are proposed to be 20 inches by 42 inches with a 26-inch projection, which complies with the ordinance section 347-110.5 which calls uh, for one projecting sign per each business per facade, at least eight feet above the sidewalk, which these all are, no more than a three foot projection, and we're proposing 26 inches, hmm. not to exceed 12 square feet in area, and each side of these is slightly under six, so we're gonna be under 12. And that concludes the presentation, so I hope you're in favor of these improvements. We think the new windows give it a little bit more cohesion and upgrade the appearance and the function, and we think the signage will also promote cohesion uh, on both facades. Could you go back to the vintage, the historic photo, please? Yes. Uh, that's not in our packet. 
Great. Okay. Um, any questions or? Yeah, okay, go ahead, John. Um, the upper part of these the window openings that even that have been covered with some sort of blank stucco panel it looks like on yeah. one side and on the other side is the metal. That's right. Are they just covering the upper part of those windows? Do the windows come up to that and then there's structure there or is that mm. just covering over I believe the window there's that runs behind it? I believe there's structure there. I think the new window stopped at that height. I don't think mm -hmm. there's, in other words, I don't think there's glass if you were to poke a hole in the ceiling, if that's your question. And then I, the question around, that I have around the corner where you have the corrugated uh, metal, I believe. Yeah. Well, what is that going to be replaced with? It's to remain, but to be painted. Okay. And the new window will be set into that space. Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, one question on the, the front, the second floor windows. In light of the historic photo that Tommy was able to uncover, would uh, you all consider matching the style of windows? Yeah. Oh, wait, let me pull that up. So, yeah, we, we considered we wouldn't be able to get the transom because as we want to get rid of the, the AC units. So we want to keep the drop ceiling, which is at that level. So the existing stucco panels oh, will stay. Oh, I got you. And then it was just a matter of spacing. We played with a lot of configurations of spacing. The window manufacturer couldn't make something wide enough that would give us the three, which is what the historic photo was, three. We tried some options that were fives and all this. And what we came up with was some are four and some are five. And that math just seemed to work out pretty well where they all, for instance, this bay with five is pretty close in width to this bay of four. Got it. So okay. it seemed like to be the best configuration that we could come up with. Thank you. So there's one pane in each of those, one yes. large pane. Yeah, exactly. Okay. What is the size of each one of those panes? Um, Gosh, I am not sure. Let's see. And you're saying that the manufacturer could not make. He couldn't make I mean, the, the width. The original photograph. Or the, oh, I'm sorry. The, the original the original building was set up in such a way that each one of those bays was divided into three. Right. Which establishes a certain kind of rhythm that this doesn't, and that would be, mm. you know. And you're saying the window manufacturing you're using cannot do a bigger window. They could do a height. They told us, I know he could do a height that, was, that will meet this, but he said, and then we chose the window manufacturer, the applicant chose a window manufacturer that we've been working with. And when we, actually let me do that. Yeah, when we showed him the widths of these and he came out and took his own measurements. And this center one in particular was the one that has the width and I, I don't have that dimension handy but he, he said he couldn't do that one what about the other ones uh, yeah the other ones he could do he could do but and there's no like creative solution for the middle one like well maybe put four rather than three yeah. i know we we looked at so many options yeah. and i'm sure we had looked at that and i think our conclusion was that this seemed the most cohesive i mean what if you did three and then five in the in that one regular one yeah that's yeah it. Or, that's a good or idea four. yeah say again i'm sorry just if he said he could do three on the others but it was just that one with five that's problematic uh, could you do three on the others and then five or all are all yes. of these a the same uniform size and that's why you want to go with four and five um each but, each bay varies slightly oh, okay but um we could do yes you could do three 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 and four or five, perhaps, yeah. but I, we looked at all sorts of configurations. Yeah. Yeah. Are any of these windows operable? Not on Bloomfield, and not these. These are these. Just this one mm -hmm. and this one on South Willow. The two in the middle, they're not. No. These are three fixed and three fixed. Uh, I liked the, the idea of doing three, 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 
3434. You know, wide, widening the. Um, this, I think the, 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 the larger maze. Right. Yeah. I think this, it, it, it's. It does. I, it's more I, consistent. With I, the, I, I think you should come back with not being tied down to just one I realize you could come to us and say well we have a window manufacturer that can only do two by two windows so this is what we used you know so you know I think we should you should come back with a this is my you know well, suggestion what, no, that's come, a good back, idea. come back with right. a proposal You're that replicates the rhythm you can use that material the right. you know whatever but I, I don't believe it can't be done. Right, and so you could come I, back to I, the I, minor I have, applications have as opposed that. to uh, as revision. A, a revision. Sorry, to revisions as opposed to uh, which oh means boy. twice a month. Correct. So just add on. Right. So historically, right, it was each opening was divided into three. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the what's there currently it was divided up into five, and you're proposing to divide it up into four. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some right. four, some so five. It's, four, it's five. been, well, it's changed twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think what you've heard is that um, the rhythm of the windows, as you're proposing, doesn't work. And, and to come back with your uh, a smaller design. number of, of uh, panels. For Why do you say it doesn't work, though? I'm I, I think there's, uh, you know, to end up with a mullion or a vertical mullion in the middle of the, in the middle, of some of those bays doesn't make any sense to this me. They was always set up so there's three, so it's space in the middle, three flanking, and three and five. Yeah. So, so okay, okay, I got. I, so all I'm uh, go back to that, you know, and that to me is more. The well, when you look at this building. rendering, it looks very modern. It, it doesn't look. It does. Well, it's just they're just playing anodized. No, but I mean the the rhythm. Just, I think I I agree with you. The rhythm doesn't work. And as far as the signage goes, for the massive signage, that's all. Uh, that's all. That's all right. okay. That's all. If that's it's fine. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Take another whack at the window. Okay. Can the applicant? Sure, please. Sure, sure, please. Yes, absolutely. You have to be sworn yeah, in. Sworn, introduce yourself. And Our vice chair will do that. <laughs> Uh, can you state your name and affiliation with the application? Uh, Ted Wickner. I'm the managing partner of the building. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're going to give this commission will be truthful and accurate to the best of your ability? Yes. Oh, thank you for hearing me. So, um, you know, we're um, very aware of the historic, you know, trying to make it um, look exactly like the way it was. So what happens, and this is just, you know, uh, the windows right now are pretty much inoperable. Um, they're not energy efficient. I can't crank them up. The, the, Cold air is just pouring in there. They're old, crummy windows. You know, I, we just purchased a building maybe uh, nine months ago. So we were trying to make mm -hmm. it the 333. And I'm just being as, as honest as I can. The cost was about triple. Um, I can't afford that. You know, it just, it's just—it's a very simple. I, again, I, I understand. Can, can I make a suggestion? May Do, I? Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting finished, you. I'm sorry. So we tried. They would have to be custom windows. Um, I went to a lot of places, so my only option was we were trying to make windows that looked like all of my neighbors. You know, they all have pretty much the same windows that we were trying to show. And my only option at this stage of the game is to keep those crummy, inefficient windows or, no. you know, go with the ones that I could afford. And it was, it was about triple. It wasn't even close, like 20,000. It became from about, and I get, no, I understand that that might not be the issue that you address, but it was like from 60 to 180. It was just, it's just not, you know, we just bought the building, it's not possible. So we were trying to do the best we could. And, you know, I can't come back, I tried, and I can't come back with a window that would appease you because it's $180,000. I went through air, a lot of manufacturers. So I just want to mention that to you. You know, I work hard. We, you know, we, you know, we're we're not big developers, and you know, I, I'm trying my best. Okay, so I Got just want mm -hmm. about Got energy. It. Can I ask you a quick couple yes, questions? Yes, sir. When you say, are you saying that the four bay window on the far left 
to go from four bays to three bays is triple the cost? Yes. For just to go from four well, to three? Well, that one. And again, I'm not a builder, so you understand. We went through with the architect and every, I mean, I'm not, you know, we went to the architect and they couldn't, they couldn't, the, these are like kind of standard manufactured sizes. So when they went from that to custom, the, the cost was triple. Is it, yes. Is directed at the architect then. The, the manufacturer said they could do three as opposed to four, and that's triple the cost to do three as opposed to four? I wasn't, I wasn't involved in the cost, but we, we drew multiple schemes and shared those schemes with the manufacturer. He came and took measurements, and then the cost conversation was had between Ted and, and him. So I'm sorry, I can't testify about that. For all the windows, total. In other words, it wasn't just replacing that one window. Let me, let me clarify it. It was to go around the whole building to do the exact size. Okay. I'm trying to come up with a solution here, perhaps. So I'm trying to get the information. Please. I'm getting part of the, I'm not getting really what the cost is to go from just that one bay from four to three. I got to believe that's reasonable. It's the bigger one in the middle that's the issue. Yeah. So is maybe that I correct? misunderstood. Is maybe so I misunderstood. So all you're asking um, to do is just change the middle one and the other ones can stay as is? No, I'm saying let's solve the middle one in a different way and if all the others can be made at three by this manufacturer. Right. Is that... Uh, the three is the problem, not the middle one. Three. Going from because four to three and all these Right, is because the then they become custom-sized windows. windows. Okay. Perhaps the, the... If this is a three-bay, yeah. whatever the, the size is of the middle one, if this middle one becomes wider and then it's equal, equal, so the A, A, B, A, A in the middle and that size in the middle would relate to the others, that might be a way to tie it together. But again, we looked at lots of different schemes and because they're all slightly different, because this one on the end is also wider, it became mm. difficult. To, you just kept running okay. into that sort of thing. Okay, okay. I mean, if it's that kind of cost difference, I can't argue. That. If it's that kind of car, I sympathize. So well, we're sympathetic. We're sympathetic. No, to, I, you but know. I understand. <laughs> you know, the, the idea of, of this commission is to make sure it looks as close to as the original right. thing, and I respect that. You know, I just, I just can't. You know, I'm not crying poverty. You know, but I, you know, right. that's just not in our budget. So um, on, on, on the uh, side on Willow Street, the, the three the three bays that are there. That's a smaller opening. Okay, you three let you can that. Trust. Yeah, this is a smaller opening than, than the first on the left. Mm -hmm. That's right. And these three are were pretty close to equal. Well, it would be. Uh, Excuse me. I have a I have a question on the uh, just on the appearance of the. The uh, currently you have uh, window air conditioning units on the Bloomfield size and some of the. Right. Uh, will those be eliminated? In other words, you're going to put in the central air conditioners. Yes. We have already uh, put that in. Okay. So they. Yes. So going forward, uh, you won't see any of those things. No, okay. Sir. The insurance company is giving me a really <coughs> hard time about uh, window units hanging over on the main street. To that's already an improvement. Okay, thank you. And so the, uh, the windows you're proposing will be black, and then the storefront windows will be painted black. So it says you're going to tie it together. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so it is an improvement with the uh, air conditioning mm -hmm. units. Yeah. I mean, even, even in terms of the uh, consistency. Right. Because, I mean, <laughs> I don't even know. It is why right. they did it that way. Well, then, if um, based on your testimony, I think that what you're pre you presented, in my opinion, would be maybe we should go ask everybody. And, and Tom, you said you had no. Uh, no, I didn't have an issue with it. The storefront windows and windows in downtown buildings change all the time. And mm -hmm. I knew these were not the original windows based on the material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were aluminum, and that um, doesn't date to the, what, the building from the 1920s. Yeah. Right, aluminum didn't come into, or aluminum windows didn't come to begin really until the 1950s. Um, so I knew there were changes without seeing the historic photograph. Um, I think the fact that they're leaving um, the same number of windows in each opening, even though it went from three to four and it's consistent, um, I think works. 
Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And again, you know, they, they do change all the time um, storefront windows. And all right. Windows. Is, there, is everyone in agreement? Agreed. Yeah. 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 Okay. So. I, no conditions? Um, well, no, not th no, I don't think so because okay. they're not coming. Pardon? The touch sheets on the window? Is that oh, that no, was, no, no, yeah. No. My, my second comment was, yeah, these detailed specifications, cut sheets, and manufacturer yeah. product information um, for the proposed windows and any lighting and color yeah, palette. So and the lighting is up there already? That, yeah. Those can light? Do they go up or down? You know, I've never seen oh. that in any both. both. Oh, both. So it's, it's okay. I think, yes, that's fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, this, is a, a, this is a C event. We need oh, we need a, yeah, yeah oh, I'll, right. I'll make the motion Sorry. to approve. Second. With the one condition that you yes. that with, the one. with the condition, yeah. right. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks for staying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think. Um, they told them to stay. Know, okay. So. Um, All right. So, so. Um, we've got one application left. We're past our 10:30 deadline. Um, I'll make a motion to extend the time. Second. Okay. This is a uh, referral to the planning board. Application 2823 for 25 North Fullerton Avenue. It's a Okay, it's a site plan approval for addition to a mixed use building. Thank you. Um, this building is subject to property, is located in the Walnut Street Potential Historic Dis Resource Area and along uh, North Fullerton Avenue Historic Streetscape. The building faces north, northwest towards North Fuller Fullerton and is a three irregular bay wide, two and a half story, 1892 vernacular building with Italianate influence. According to permit cards, the building has been used as a real estate office with a single apartment since 1959. The applicant proposes to reconfigure the principal building to reduce the existing office use and expand the existing apartment, including two additions on the second floor um, uh, on to the, uh, uh, and also includes extending the detached garage to connect it to the principal building. And so, may you would you introduce yourself? I'm Nicholas Coelho with Cyrus Architecture. I'm the architect of the uh, Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're going to give this commission will be truthful and accurate to the best of your ability? Yes. Duly sworn. So as noted, it's uh, 25 North Fullerton Avenue, uh, Block 301, Lot 5, in the Walnut Street Potential Historic Research. I would like to also thank you for staying uh, late to review this application. Uh, the site is approximately uh, 60 feet by 175, and it's uh, 0.241 acres. It's located on the east side of North Fullerton Avenue. And as mentioned, the lot has an existing two and a half uh, structure in front and a rear one story nine car garage in the rear. And within that two and a half uh, story structure, uh, the first two floors are commercial and then there's a studio dwelling in the attic. And the lot is primarily uh, paving with some landscaping in the front. Oh, yeah, thank you. And along the south side of the front building and along the south side of the garage and there's a thin strip along the north of the front building. And the lot slopes uh, about 1.25 feet from the front to the rear. Here's a, just an area view of the site. Here's the street view where you could see uh, one story brick buildings on either side. And uh, you can see the landscaping in the front of the building. Here are historic photos of the building. You can see it originally had a porch, uh, which was removed at some point. And here's the current condition, where you can see uh, on both the north and the south side, there were these one-story additions that were built so the front facade was uh, previously modified. 
This is, here's an image of the rear of that front building where there's an entrance to the first story, the first floor commercial space. And here's an image of the garage where you can see the front building in the back. And <coughs> this is from the bank, the side that's facing the bank. And you could take note of the existing landscaping that's on uh, the bank side. And this is the existing weather vane on top of the garage. So as noted, our proposal is to expand uh, the second floor ab above the first floor additions to, we did that in order to maintain the existing for footprint of the building. And then we're also planning on extending the, gr the wall of the garage to connect the two buildings to make it one principal structure on the site and add a uh, one-story addition that contains two dwelling units for a total of three dwelling units. And the studio apartment uh, is gonna be expanded to the south side of the second floor as we'll see in the floor plans. We're also providing for safety a walkway from uh, the garage to the main uh, walkway at the entrance. And we are providing uh, an ADA parking space, even though neither of the buildings are required to be accessible since we're redoing striping, the ADA parking space is required. All of the, all of the landscaping, the new landscaping will be native to New Jersey. We plan on keeping the existing landscaping that's currently around the front building. We're providing uh, new street trees and uh, evergreen plantings to, to screen the new trash enclosure in the rear and also landscaping along the east of the garage. And uh, one thing to note is uh, when we presented to the DRC, that scheme had more of a grass creek area and since then, we've modified it to have additional landscaping along this edge and on the north side. <clears throat> Here's uh, the lighting plan where we are lighting the path that I had mentioned to the front and also for the parking. Here is the first floor plan where currently you enter uh, to get to the second floor commercial space and the studio apartment. And then as mentioned, the first floor door in the back. We're going to be utilizing one of the existing parking spaces to create an entry to uh, the upper two units. We also have uh, bicycle parking and as I noted, the ADA parking space. And we're demolishing uh, the west wall of the existing garage so to provide an EV charger that's shared by the two parking spaces. Here is uh, the second floor plan where as noted, uh, we've, we're utilizing this southern part of the second floor as the main entrance for uh, unit one in the front building. And this floor, uh, there's, it's 691 square feet, and this floor consists of the living, the kitchen, and the workspace, and the powder room. And then both uh, unit two and unit three, they have one bedroom, office, terraces, living, kitchen, and bathroom, and laundry closets. And then the third, the third floor shows the upper floor level of unit one, which uh, is 896 square feet for a total of uh, 1,587 square feet. And it consists of two bedrooms, a study, and a primary bathroom. Regarding the elevations, uh, 
We're planning at the front building to remove all of the existing siding, except that the first <coughs> floor additions that project out from the facade. And our expectation is that we're going to keep uh, the brick um, on the other sides of the facade. And once we remove the siding, we'll have to confirm the extent of the brick and the condition of it. But then the second floor, we would have um, new siding. And we're also planning on having new windows and new lighting. Regarding uh, Mr. Connolly's comments about the style of the building, we can uh, lower the sills of the front facing or the windows at the addition so they have more of a narrow look that's, uh, that goes with the Italian uh, style. Also, as you can see, uh, the ridge of the well, for the addition, we are planning at the base to keep the exposed uh, masonry and then have wood or composite shingles on the facade. And the roof would be, uh, the gable roof would be composition shingles and the dormer roofs to be metal standing seam. Uh, the proposal shows two cupolas with uh, weather vanes, one of them being the one that's salvaged, salvaged from the original garage. Currently, the ridge height is about three feet below the ridge of the, the front building. And then depending on how the commission feels, we can look at lowering that height or adjusting the slope of the gable roof so that it's more subordinate because uh, <coughs> the height of the weather vane uh, is above the height of the chimney about uh, six and a half feet. We did want to provide a nice entry and look to the building for the residents. Uh, so we have a recessed entry and, and um, like wood outriggers above that's also mimicked on the side entrance that goes to the sidewalk. At the rear of the front building, we will be removing the uh, fire escape, the existing fire escape. And on the side of the addition that's facing the bank, we provide terraces that we feel adds a variety to uh, that facade as opposed to a, a blank wall, especially seen from the sidewalk and down the, the bank's driveway. And uh, currently, we're showing uh, the balcony have a, a knee wall of the same material. Uh, depending on how the commission feels, we are open to an alternate of having a metal railing, which would provide a more open feeling um, on that facade. And then this is just the side entry at the walkway without the front building. And here is the east elevation of the existing garage with the addition with the front building and, and beyond. And that concludes um, my presentation. And I'm open to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, questions? Sure, I can, I can start. Um, so, for starters, you mentioned um, to address Mr. Connolly's comments, you could bring the sill down. Yeah. Uh, if, if that's the case, um, is it really necessary to alter the front of the building for this project? And um, you, you know, has the building been altered in the past? I'm trying to understand what the reasoning would be for changing the uh, front of the building. The building has been altered in the past uh, with these one-story additions. Oh, that's right, you said that. So okay. we were planning yeah. on building uh, okay. on top of that to maintain the same footprint. I see, I see. Okay, sorry, it's 11 o'clock. No. Uh, <laughs> so it's getting a little punchy. Um, um, and then I, the um, the garage, did we talk about uh, what era that's from? Do we know when that was built or? I'm, I don't know. 
Tom, do you have any sense of when that might have been from or, or no? Based on the material, um, the block, I would say 1910s, 20s. The garage itself, the garage too? The itself. Wow, okay. Um, okay, that's all my questions for now, thanks. You said that you, um, you proposed to take off the siding on the front of the house. What are you replacing it with? So uh, you can see in the photos that there is uh, there's a brick base at the front. So um, there is brick underneath the, the siding. We don't know exactly what the extent of the brick is. The yeah, that, that was one of my comments. Are you yeah. sure about that? Because yeah. that based on the, the architectural style and the historic photographs, it looks like this was a a balloon frame building, mm -hmm. right? You could see some of the sheathing where the porch was removed on the front of the building. Um, I find it hard to believe uh, that there would be brick all the way up to the second floor. Well, so we can have the <coughs> Maybe to, to match more of the existing conditions, keep. Yeah, I would just like you to confirm that. I'm just saying it's come down. <laughs> hard for me to believe that oh, yes. there would be brick there. And um, um, my next question is: Will does the is the um, the plane of the house and the plane of the garage? Do they meet up, or does the garage? What do you see from the from? Uh, North Fullerton of the garage, aside from a glancing view. So you'll see it does project out. Uh, if we look at the, the existing site plan, there's a wide driveway. You can see the full garage. Oh, right. I yeah, see. yeah, there's okay. a very wide space and between the next building. Yeah, and it projects south from the main facade of of the front house. So in in the street elevation, you will see that portion that contains there. that contains that side entry with the walkway that leads to the sidewalk as well as the terrace so one of the terraces mm -hmm. for that unit number two okay if there are uh, any other questions we'll turn it over to Tom <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm gonna go through my four comments that I had and then um, I think there are some things we need to talk about um, so my comment, my first comment had to do with the proposed alter, alterations to the existing Italianate vernacular style building uh, fronting North Fulton Avenue does not preserve the historic character of the architecture. The proposed additions and new shed roof dormer do not preserve the historic building's form and relationship to the site and the historic streetscape. Preservation of historic buildings in general implies minimal change to the primary or public elevations. It is recommended that the new additions be attached to a secondary elevation only after determining that the new use cannot be successful, successfully met by altering non-significant interior spaces. Um, so, well, we'll come back to that. Um, my second comment was the proposed connection of the existing garage to the primary building alters historic form and as a result changes historic character and has too much of a negative impact on the historic Italian vernacular style home and does not meet the standards. Um, the proposed alterations, this is comment number three, the proposed alterations to the existing garage should be simple and unobtrusive in design and should not detract from the historic building. The design for the expanded garage should be subordinate to the historic building and not compete in detailing or character. And my fourth comment, um, which we spoke about already, was the elevation drawings should, should reflect the actual existing conditions. The architect shall confirm the existence of brick as an exterior cladding material for the first floor of the primary building. There's a lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think we should talk about the two, the two buildings, but the, the primary building, the Italianate building um, that fronts North Fullerton, um, by, is my opinion, 
adding the additions over top of additions that were previously installed at some earlier date um, really dramatically alters the building um, negatively. Um, and, and I think your, your drawing, your elevation drawing, really highlights that negative impact. Um, there, you're showing the shadow where the front door is, basically creating a black hole where the focus of the building really should be the front entry, and it's no longer visible. Um, those additions, and I, I think really um, negatively impact, you, you no longer see the, the cross gabled roof, um, the two story bay, which are character defining features of the Italian exile. It's no longer, the, the architecture language is no longer visible. And shed roofs on the front of a, a building the <coughs> primary facade, uh, that they really belong on rear elevations. If you look at your side elevation drawing, it's, I, I just by looking at it without knowing it's siding, I would guess that those shed roofs were the rear of the building. Um, I, I, I would love for the, those, those two additions to be removed and the porch restored, but that's too much to ask for. Um, and connecting the garage to the building with a completely different architectural language does not work, right? You, we have an Italian building and you connect a new building with a completely different architectural language. Um, those two things don't. Why, I have a question, why are the two buildings, is there some reason why they're connected to each other? We're connecting it to so that there's one principal building on the site. Um, so as to avoid the variance. Correct. Yeah. But architecturally, it doesn't yeah. work. I would prefer it being separated and get a variance for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, would, yeah. That, that would be use, right? Because you, for a, it would. Because you wouldn't be able to have Tonerite in the zone uh, residential and accessory. Right. It would be there would be two principal buildings on a lot. Um, I don't. I'm not sure what type of variance that would be. Actually, I, I think it, it would be a, a D1. And then you, it would go have to go to the zoning board instead. Yeah, which is a use variance that would go to the the board of adjustment and requires a higher number of votes and yeah it's a significant variance to ask for it, I mean well if the style of the we, we were trying to I guess have the facade hark back to the original use of the garage, which was a barn, um, and pick up some of that language. But I understand the discrepancy between the two different styles. Like if we change the the shingle style of the facade and had siding that matched the front building, so it would be more of a cohesive uh, language between the two. Um, with, even though there, there is that connection, would that be more what you're looking for or? For me, I think that it, it might work better and then I think you need to dial back some of the, uh, the elements on, on the building, right? This would be a, a simple, simple in, in, in form and, and really yes, especially the two. Um, cupolas. In the front, those two oh, blocks yeah. that you've added um, to to it. Is there a way to those? Uh, I didn't understand. When I looked at this, I really didn't understand what I was looking at, I'll right. tell you the truth. But the that's the front, the yeah, it, that's the front of the uh, building. And what you're proposing is to build up on either side of the front door 
like two blocks that go up. Right. So is there a way, as Tom said, to dial it back, to leave it just not, don't go up to the second floor the way that's, that really exists now? The current, it's in the current condition. I believe that's it. Uh, right, I mean, uh, you know, the existing. We, right, it would, it would affect the layout of the apartment. And because we're taking over some of the commercial area with the expansion of the apartment, we were trying to make up that area on, on the opposite side. I, I understand that, we, but is there a way? But is there a way to do that that has some sense of design, a, a design quality? Because now right. it really doesn't. It just looks like two boxes that have been attached to a, a gable, front-facing gable. Right. Yeah, I think my yeah. biggest problem is the front doors and this right. recess. That, right. You know. <laughs> Which speaks more to somebody said apartment building. Did you just somebody? Said, I don't know. I mean, the, fir the first floor is, is an office space, right? And the yes. second floor was an office space, and you took half of it to become an apartment. Correct. Yeah, it really should be office on the ground floor, apartment on the second and third floor. Um, but then you'd be taking away a lot of the office space. It just seems odd to me that you have office on one side of the hall and residential on the opposite without, side on the without, second floor. Without losing space. Without losing space, you could bring the whole fas that whole gable facade forward. If you extrude it, right, if you, you just, just extrude it forward, the facade. then you keep the form of the architecture. Right. You don't have these two things leaning up against it. Just bring it forward and salvage your square footage. Um, that would be more visually, would hang together a little bit better. Yeah, and you'd still end up with a recessed entry. I, I, I think entry. you'd really have to rework almost the whole, <laughs> whole facade. The facade, the front facade. Yeah, I, I think, the front bring the I think you can solve it just yes, working with the massing in a different yeah, way. Somebody made a bad decision to put those additions on previously, and <laughs> I think we're, we're making it worse. Okay. Um, and I think the connection between the new build, the new in order to keep this all one primary building, to have some sort of better reveal there. Um, not that you really see this facade. Tom, Tommy, what's, because there's no actual connection between the two buildings. Like you can't pass from building one no. to building no, two. No, no, it's just a physical punching. with the wall coming up to it. Tommy, what, like, what's the minimum requirement to make it a single principal building? Like, could. That's a good question. Could you eliminate this area here? It's just a hallway and then the on the first parking, floor, bike really, parking and storage, really bike parking and just area. connect it right there. So at least from the street, it looks like two separate buildings. I mean, physically. I mean, they'll, they'll still be, I mean, they're, they're only physically touching right here. Right. So maybe you'll eliminate that way. That way, visually, it still right. looks yeah, like. Yeah, and that would still. Like you're saying essentially what I'm saying. It's yeah. Just more of a reveal yeah. there. Yeah. Right, and that would still be considered a yeah. one principal building. This just seems like a loophole in the, in the zoning um, that, that mm. doesn't seem to work. Um. So we're not supposed to actually design the building, but I think we're, we're, we're uh, in agreement that the... I, I understand the, the direction. That yeah, the direction that you should be, go, we, we should be going in. Right. Yes, yeah, and what we would like to see. So if you can redo that and then I think make the uh, that um, y your idea about uh, scaling back the cupolas on the on the garage mm -hmm. now um, I think is it because they really predominate over over the whole mm -hmm. uh, scheme yeah um, and you also mentioned about uh, making the roof just to bring it po right possibly uh, either or in conjunction uh, Lowering, right, lowering the roof and make, possibly making it a, sh a little bit shallower so it's mm -hmm. not as, mm -hmm. so it doesn't fight with the, the front building. Mm -hmm. But I think the cupolas really need to, to, yeah. to come down. All right. Yeah. So, um, uh, I, I do have another question though. Sure. Um, 
there were, looked like there were windows on the south elevation of the garage that were uh, infilled? Yes. So we were keeping them infilled. We had reviewed that and uh, the applicant wanted to keep them that way. Right, it looked like you changed the, the height of where the masonry started. Yeah, yeah, so the windows, we're basically creating like a wainscot showing the existing masonry. The masonry, the existing extends up higher, but we uncover a portion of it with the new siding. That was the intent. Okay, so any other further uh -huh. questions or discussions? So we, as not approving it as, as draw, as it, as right. your well, presentation. It's just recommendations. Oh, rec right, I'm sorry, recommendations, okay. So, I mean, I, I would incorporate all of Our uh, Tom's, Tom's comments, comments, comments okay. Plus yep. the comment about uh, lowering the cupolas. I think that was in your comments. Right, yeah, that was it was lowering or removing them? Removing them. I think the whole building yeah. needs to be yeah. simplified. There are a lot of things going on. Yeah. Um, Make it one style. Yeah. Well, you, do you ha already have one co one uh, weather vane up there, right? Yeah, it's just the weather. Because it's existing. Right. But it's on yeah. first, uh, one story garage. Somebody had it at yeah. one point, but, you know. Yeah. But it was a nice <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's no but reason to put two. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tommy, why don't you just incorporate all of Tom's comments and then additional comments being removal of the cupolas, um, exploring, like John said, a, a greater reveal between the two buildings. Um, and then is there one other comment? I think the other comment about the, the front. front. The, front. front. Yeah. 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 the front. Yeah, I, I have that either the, the second story additions on the front slash west facade should be eliminated or consider extruding the front facade so that you maintain the roof line right. and allow for gave, interior expansion. Right. Right. And, and uh, like, I'll send this to you, Kathleen, so you can review to make sure it's sure. consistent with what everybody okay. said. All right. Okay. Before okay. I send it Would to you. Will you come back and re represent here? No. Or just just go right right the the you, it just yeah. goes right to the planning board then. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll draft a report summarizing these comments and it will go to the planning Great. board. Thank you. Yep. All right, thank you. Sorry, thank you. it's thank late. You. <laughs> We're just going to move ahead. Uh, oh, um, next committee reports. Okay, well, the Label Street Manufacturing District uh, nomination report is done. Hot off the presses today. There were a few tweaks on it this afternoon. Thank you, Tommy, for your help. Um, so he's, you're going to send it to everybody? Yes, okay. I will send that out. Um, it's going to go up on the website. I'm trying to get a, a sub page created on the website. Our, our website person has been out for a long time, but I'll, I'll figure that out. Yeah. Um, so that'll go up, and then we're going to notice it in accordance with what I the zoning ordinance. I think you should explain the noticing. And yeah. So, so the way that the zoning ordinance is written, it requires that for historic district or site nominations, that the the HPC's um, hearing on that topic is noticed 20 days, at least 20 days in advance. In the paper, all of the property owners are sent the notice as well. Um, doesn't say anything about surrounding properties, just the, the properties included. And I think they're all on, under the same ownership, yeah. the three it's parcels. The, yeah, it's one building and tenants, right? So well, there's, th the there's actually three parcels. It's a, right. it's a district nomination, oh, okay. correct? Um, but I think they're all under the same ownership. Um, so yeah, so we'll, we'll handle that. We'll get the notice in order so that come January, um, you can introduce it. And then you guys would essentially vote on a resolution making recommendation to council. council. To, the, yeah, to council, and then it goes to the planning board, and then it goes the plan, to council. Yes, and and the way around. I just want you to be cognizant is that I really uh, focus on the neighborhood, you know, mm -hmm. the neighborhood and the auxiliary um, businesses that were down there in the 19th century, because it, it really speaks to the fact of the neighborhood with a whole paper industry. It, mm -hmm. it, when I, it was fascinating. It was a lot of work, but it was really very That was a huge undertaking, Chair. Mm -hmm. I, my hat's off to you for getting <laughs> right. that. That's really uh, impressive work. So, yeah. so well, read it first. <laughs> Fair enough. 
And then our second is the state area survey, and I would like to thank Mr. Rooney because he really he really did the the, the, the <laughs> major work. I think I only did 50, uh, uh, if, if that. But uh, what we've done is we've gone through all of the surveys to make sure that they're correct. And there was some tweaking in the, um, the, the uh, text part, but Tommy has been able to uh, correct that. And then could you speak to about uh, your conversation with the state? Yeah, so I, so I reached out to um, the State Historic Preservation Office because we had already submitted this report and the surveys to the state for their records. Um, and basically I, I contacted her and said we made some corrections to it. And so I, I sent those to her today with a memo that just summarizes the changes that were made. And so now they're filed with the state. We can, um, we can get those surveys back up on the historic inventory viewer because we had taken them down when we realized mm -hmm. that there were errors in them. Um, so we can get those back and up. And you mean all, by that all the surveys, right? That all of the, right. all of the little purple dots of the potential right, because historic they they couldn't. Survey and the, I think the big thing with this, besides the mistakes that were corrected, is that there's one, uh, we added a key uh, structure down at uh, the Goodwillie House, which should have been a key structure. I don't know why they didn't include that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's good. We've got that finished for the year. And then we have the uh, meeting calendar for 2023. Has everybody been able to look at that? Mm -hmm. Do we have to vote on that? All right. So yeah, you just. All right, so. You vote to approve it as drafted it, or if you want to change any of the, the dates that yeah. don't work for people. Okay. But it's the second, it's the second Thursday every month is okay. how it's drafted. Motion to approve by. Motion to approve. Yes, All in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Okay. And then the sustainable land, loose, land use pledge, um, which did you find any more about that? So I, I talked to Janice about that today because she just basically it was it was passed it was a resolution passed by council and then she felt that that it was appropriate to distribute to all of the boards and commissions that deal with development, um, but we weren't given any direction on what exactly to do with it. I think it's like an advisory. Yeah. Like, are we supposed to adopt that resolution? No, it's adopted. Council has, council has already adopted it. Um, but who crafted it? I don't know. Okay, because I think from our, what I, what I asked you is how does it affect our work? And really for our work, it should have a, a, a paragraph in there about adaptive reuse for buildings, because that's. Right, and I, and I talked to Janice about like, well, should it be revised? And she said, that it doesn't need to be revised and and I think I sent this in an email but the fact that it's not explicitly noted in that resolution doesn't mean that it's not mm -hmm. a sustainable activity and that we should no, be and, doing and, it. No, and so. that's all well and good except that I think there needs to be better communication between the land boards because uh, you know And again, I don't know who dra I don't okay. think it was the planning it wasn't the planning board it wasn't the board of adjustment it wasn't you guys. I don't know who drafted The Environmental it. Commission somebody asked Potentially, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's the mystery, <laughs> the mystery <laughs> advice. It's really more advisory just to you know look at it and digest it, but it doesn't doesn't have any immediate effect on anything. Okay. All right. All right. So, uh, motion to motion to adjourn. Uh, second. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. All right. Aye. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you in January. So, yeah. See you in January. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays. Yeah.